You can now follow me on all my social media platforms to find out who my latest guest will be. And don't forget to click the subscribe button and the notifications bell so you're notified for when my next podcast goes live. And boom, we're on. And today's guest, we've got Bernd Sterlander. Bernd, how are you? I'm very good, thank you. Thanks for having me. Thanks for coming all the way over. Well, that invitation is not the, something you say no to. <laughs> <laughs> I appreciate you. it. Yeah. Your book, The Sudden Impulse, about the Madeleine McCann case, you dive right into a lot of, yeah, listen, a lot of territory that people don't. I think you've been pretty fair also, and I think it's important to understand there is a lot out there about this case. This child is... Well, not a child anymore, but then it's probably the biggest missing person in the world ever. Um, it has been for the last, what, 17 years now? What was it, 3rd of May 2007? In your book, which we'll get into, you think it was the second and dates change and you kind of contradict and look into the contradictions of the statements. Um, there's a lot out there about this case. It's very... Um, Still a lot of question marks unanswered. Um, I think their interviews, what they've gave, didn't do them any justice, but it doesn't mean they're not. That doesn't mean they're guilty either of any misdoing. And, uh, but, yeah, people are still very interested in this topic. But first and foremost, how are you? I'm very good. This is very exciting, of course. Uh, I'm not a person that seek attention in something. I'd rather be invisible on an island, Madeira, for example. Mm -hmm. um, but um, there comes a point in time where you actually get onto something that is uh, worth writing about, uh, especially because it's, it's a big case for many people. There's a lot of people that uh, hope before they die, they get to know what happened to Maddie. And for me, it was... Uh, opportunity and, and, and time, because I moved to, uh, to southern Portugal uh, December 2016, um, and the only knowledge I had about the case was uh, they started to pop up forums on the internet and Facebook pages, so I had a, uh, some knowledge about the forensics and, and the police files, and uh, I was not active on any of these forums and social media, so and I think it's a good thing because I started off with blank sheets 10 years in. So this was right before the 10th anniversary. And it, it, it's a strange thing, but I lived almost six months in the Algarve before I took a look. I was a little bored and I went to, to look at the town. Actually, I showed my daughter it on, on uh, March 1, 2017. And then 17 days later, 18th of March, 2017, I went to town and I walked around and I was very curious about taking things in, you know? And um, then I went up on the hillside and then I uh, remembered Kate's turning point to dream, the alleged dream that she called to Paiva, the liaison, um, when Jerry was in Washington DC uh, about Maddie being hidden on a hillside overlooking a beach in Praia de Luz. And I thought, hey, what is this? Are you trying to you know, have the police find her. Uh, and then Jerry's response when he came back, uh, he was in court in Lisbon, then he was alone on, on camera. And he said, it's not true that Kate had a dream that she was buried somewhere. He used that word. And then I thought, wow, he's uh, kind of confirming that that hillside might be very interesting. And uh, I went up that hillside and I had this revelation about their their jogging. You know, it was made fun of them. You know, you're a sportsman, you know, how it's important to work out and you want to do that. But when you lose a child, uh, you can't eat, you can't sleep, and you definitely can't play tennis or go for a jog. Uh, that's just my opinion. But uh, the point was that uh, they were jogging on the hillside and they made sure that everybody knew by that photo. They had a photo shoot, I think on May 19th, 7 a.m. in the morning, where you see the backdrop, you see the church. So everybody knows where they're jogging. And then I thought, this is brilliant. If they hid her there, in the future, they could always go back and nobody would suspect anything why they were there. And then something peculiar uh, was uh, written by Jerry on the blog, his blog. He, he uh, talked about the jog from apartment 5A um, where they ran to the top of the hillside to the landmark and he called it a 19 minutes and they didn't stop. And then I thought, well, that's peculiar. Nobody cares how much time it takes to run there. 
And then uh, I actually wanted to check for myself. I was kind of bad shape, overweight, but I did it in less than 12 minutes. So I thought that was strange, you know, because they would beat me on anything past a half a mile. And I was walking on the steep parts, but they are runners, you know. And um, so there was something about that hillside that, that really stuck out. So I decided to do a methodical survey on the hill. Where would I do it? given I was jogging there or playing golf. And, um, and this fits also this hillside theory with uh, Mark Harrison, the former Scotland Yard superstar. Uh, he was there for a week with uh, Mr. Amaral, the first detective. And uh, he, um, uh, I think maybe his, his job was to figure out where would somebody hide something uh, in the area. And that was between the golf course on top of that cliff um, and the town. So, and then you had the South African there with the device and he also marked that area. So, um, but I started with clean sheets and uh, I, I found some certain areas there that uh, could be plausible. And uh, I had a really extreme approach really, because I was looking for a grave. And this has to do with profiling of a mother losing a child. And especially if potentially there is a SA involved and uh, whether she knew or not, but what could she do after the child has passed is maybe giving her a more beautiful grave than we could dream of. That was my insane approach. And uh, when you have a spot or a grave on that hillside um, and the mother returning so many times per year um, alone, uh, I thought that it would be plausible to think that she would romanticize this in a, in, in a way by placing symbols there. So I was looking for very subtle symbols there, like a heart, pink flowers, uh, the letter M. And the weird thing was that in this uh, area too, um, I found all of the above. And then I put up a camera there and then boom, here comes Jerry McCann past. What are the chances? So um, I had tried to get in contact with Amaral um, for about eight months before that. But uh, after I had uh, this camera, uh, this recording of this person walking past this spot one, I call it, with the symbols, I knew that uh, I could go solo and do this on my own by starting a cat and mouse game with anonymous emails to them. Not about where, but that it might have been discovered just to create some uh, uh, stormy waters and uh, sleepless nights to have them come back and narrow down the area. So I put up several cameras there and eventually um, a friend of his showed up. So, uh, and after that, I have uh, both of them showing up and I waited a week. I tried to have actually him come and uh, remove the remains, but they didn't, but they showed up later and I have some recordings there that are very interesting. Um, so uh, yeah, it's, was that the start of it all? For that you? was the start of all, and I, and I, my uh, idea was that there would never be a book unless I had a find, you know. Um, and it's, it's dangerous to program yourself, telling yourself something because it it becomes like concrete, you know. Um, but then friends of mine told me about the, that this story is something you have to tell. I mean, even if you make it like a fiction or something. But, uh, and I was going to move to Spain, uh, and uh, I even considered Italy, but then I actually, very strangely, uh, two days later, I bought an apartment in Praia de Luz. I didn't want to be that crazy guy, you know, going and digging and stuff, uh, even though the, the police, the PJ, Policia Judiciaria, the criminal police, uh, they actually said it would be easier if you went and checked. So I started a little check digging. And this is what, um, I saw some reaction to that and um, on the video by Jerry. And um, I thought I could play on that. And that's why I started this game of uh, trying to narrow it down and get some reactions. And uh, so it's very strange for me because if she wasn't there, they didn't put her there. Why would they come? Why would they react? They would tell Operation Grange, Scotland Yard, and they would tell... Policia Judiciaria, and then they would tell me, did you send more emails, you know? And um, so that didn't happen. 
and instead they sent friends, you know, probably because of fear um, of maybe being trapped because I confused them with those emails. I can tell you that. So the emails, did you message Jerry? Yeah, well, he showed up. I put a camera where I had the symbols and after he noticed something had been done there, basically me test drilling and the police didn't want to meet me. So I thought, what would I do? And then I suggested to my lawyer, you know, say, hey, maybe I should send some emails and try to trick him to come and dig up the body. I mean, the remains. So I did. And uh, the first email was basically just uh, read carefully. It was kind of cryptic, but it was, uh, as you noticed, it's about to be discovered. We can delay them a week and that's it. And then I was hoping it would panic and come and try to remove it. And I waited for him in the, in the bush for a week, in the, in the night, in the dark, you know, with the, the whole shabam, you know, night vision, different did, gear. Did Jerry show up at night? No, he didn't. But they did uh, show up uh, two weeks later, he and uh, Kate. Yeah, that's interesting. Yeah. So you've sent Jerry McCann an email to say you're about to be, it's about to be d discovered. Yeah. And because I had to play on to, that. And he showed up to the spot where you think Madeline's buried. Yeah. And after that, when they showed up, I had to put up more cameras because I saw they were, they had interest higher up. They were rushing by spot one. And then uh, I had to, you know, try to narrow down the area because I knew she was in the area. Even in the presentation to the PJ, I said that if she's not at spot one, it had become a memorial. Maybe it was their first choice, Kate's choice when she was running on the hill with her crumbled photo of Maddie in her hands and she felt relieved when she got back home. She had found the spot. That's my interpretation of that in her diary and book. Um, yeah, so it kept going with these, uh, this game and it uh, succeeded because, uh, of course, I scared them off uh, and who wouldn't be scared, but uh, they sent friends. And uh, I think the first um, Mr. Nugget, I call him, uh, his behavior was very strange, bizarre, but not when you understand that he might have been under the instruction by Jerry to, under a white lie, that the PJ is doing something there, could you please check, make sure nobody sees you. That's exactly how he behaves, in my interpretation. But then, uh, a few months later, his uh, wife shows up uh, higher up, and that's when things turn, because she obviously looks like she's in the know, and they shouldn't be there. It's too close to the final spots. So it's very interesting. And uh, yeah, that's where I uh, cut you off earlier because I said that I didn't want to number how many videos I had because of course this is a, a sort of a game of pressure. And of course I want them to crack to avoid creating problems for the Nuggets, which seem like nice people. Um, the way they treated their dog, very nice. Um, and they are not involved in any way uh, or shape or form or what happened back then but they are involved by having gone to check for the McCanns. And that's their problem. That's my trump card. Uh, and I'm going to play my cards uh, slowly by slowly uh, making uh, moves. The media doesn't want to play, but I just want people to read uh, the way I put it together of why it happened the night before and how I can prove that there was no abduction. And that ends it all, right? Mm -hmm. And it's not about taking them down. It's taking the lie down. And that's what I'm all in for. The whole thing is messy. Seeing their interviews on the TV just doesn't look right. Now, I've interviewed many people now. I've interviewed many people who have lost kids, loved ones, and they're still distraught 10, 15, 20 years later when they speak about it. People who have got kids missing, their face, they just look distraught. Now, it doesn't mean everybody reacts the same, so we've got to stay open-minded to that. And plus, their doctors, maybe they've seen a lot of cold stuff, but they just seem very it just seemed it always seemed as if they were justifying for me now i'm not a detective but and i could be wrong and if i ever do get it wrong and they weren't involved i'd be the first to apologize as well but just the interviews that they've done the dates the the kind of first of all leaving your kids at two years old twins and three years old is neglect anyway they should never have done that they're babies they're not kids at 12 and 13 um the friends that they were with and then out jogging and playing tennis two or three days later washing the daughter's teddy bear the dogs have sniffed blood in the room they've sniffed out the dead body in their car i think 20 odd days later um 
it just seems it seems and I've got to be honest I feel as if they know a lot more um, and there seems a, a bit of a cover up I know the Portuguese police they were suspects also for Madeline's disappearance at the start is that correct? They were the whole time and yeah. still are yeah so first of all your book The Sudden Impulse this photo here is this where you believe Madeline is hidden? It's actually the area there on the hillside so it's uh... and where can people buy your book? Well, they are in uh, Portugal. Uh, you can buy it off the website if you go on uh, foreigndetective.com uh, or thesuddenimpulse.com. You will find a link to walk, uh, walk in Portugal. Okay. But it will be a digital version uh, very soon. Yeah. Sorry, I'm not prepared. I, 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 That's okay. That's perfect. I'm not, and I'm, people, we can leave the link for people yeah. to check this book out. It is a long read, but there's so much information and it. yeah. it's important to read. And listen, make up your own mind. But before we get into everything, I always like to go back to the start with my guest, Bert. Just kind of where did you grow up and how it all began? Yeah, well, I um, I was born in, in Austria when my uh, father from northern Norway studied medicine there and he met my mother in Austria at the university. Um, when I was two and a half years old, we moved to northern Norway, land of the midnight sun above the Arctic, and uh, did the normal stuff. And then the army, we have mandatory duty. Uh, I did 12 months in the army military police. And after that, we apply for UN forces. It's very popular. So I did a, a tour there as a military police as well. And uh, been a foreign exchange student in St. Louis a year after that. Several colleges, different engineering, optometry, uh, business school. I hurt my neck playing football like you did. What position did you play? Uh, left wing in 4-3-3 or a strike rate for. Uh, four two. You must be about what six two six three. Uh, Height. Uh, six one. Not six one. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but I had a, a rocket of a left leg that could have uh, reached far. But I, I hurt my neck and uh, I um, had to retrain from optometry to the business school. And then I had this. Uh, I was sitting with a coin and I had this uh, funny idea about alignment system for putters. So I patented the first alignment system for putters and then, you know, a few years later had a whole brand and everything. I was just going to sell the idea. And uh, yeah, even TaylorMade Adidas Golf wanted to buy it all, but I was loyal to my friends, an idiot, uh, uh, you would say. I mean, I was, I was, I mean, loyalty is, you shouldn't put a price on that, right? Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, and, but it, it's coincidences, which I don't believe in. So I'm actually glad it didn't happen, uh, you know, uh, being in San Diego working for TaylorMade Adidas Golf would be okay, but I'd rather be in Portugal and uh, do this. And uh, not just because of the excitement, it's just because it has meaning and it's important. And it's, uh, it's a good feeling to crack a code. And um, of course, that was the problem with the, for the Portuguese police. That was the timeline because they couldn't convince the, the state attorneys to prosecute based on the evidence they had, you know, the cadaver scent, the cadaver dogs, the blood found in the rental car, you know, um, over three weeks later, um, because they didn't think they could conspire and agree on the statements in such a short time and clean the apartment in that time. And that also became a guideline for me in terms of my big discovery. We, of course, if, if we find her there at my findings in, in my area, at the spots, that would be, of course, uh, insane. But for me, it's also, it's more important about the timeline because it changes everything. And it, it's, it's revealed by the evidence and by their words, they're guiding me to the night before and in so many ways. And it wasn't like me wanting to try to fit that timeline. It was just being aware of statement and statement analysis. And when you have Kate, talking about the night before as the night of all nights, you should maybe start to take a closer look, right? If you have a mother who lost her child being abducted the next night, why would you call the day before the night of all nights? And she talked about the unprecedented move that she loathed even to mention that she slept in that bedroom the night before, okay? So, but she felt it, she needed to put that on record because there had to be someone that having slept on that bed by the window because they knew that if there was an abductor going in and, or out that window, they would have to step on that bed. So somebody had to mess that up. But she slept there for a different reason, of course. It was to 
take care of the, qui- the twins when the chaos abrupted after the accident the night before. For me, it was it started with I wanted to find her if she was on the hill, and I was convinced she was on the hill. Okay, and then it turned to me uh, during COVID. I sat down and actually started to read the statements really thoroughly, and uh, then things start to pop out, and everything made sense once you. Um, once I discovered the timeline. And, and of course, they had some mistakes when they speak on video and everything, but also in their written statements, there's it's a multiple angle pointing to this timeline that I discovered. Um, there has been suggestions that of earlier that week, which makes sense because of that last photo that put the police uh, totally in the tunnel in terms of tunnel vision because that last photo was taken most likely on the Sunday before and this is they said it was taken on thursday so um then everything changes you know the whole game but there was um a lot of these photos that they had on cameras they were blackened and messed with and they were in the hands of the mccann's and the team mccann up to three weeks especially this this last photo it wasn't even delivered with the other photos so we wouldn't have any value in court anyways as an evidence and the metadata on the digital photo uh, stamp was also uh, updated twice so it's been messed with it could be any date so that just opened up the the book in terms of finding but if you had uh, if you had more time, there would be less mistakes. But there was a crying incident, a big one, that Mrs. Fenn upstairs from there, an 80-year-old lady, she heard a child cry, not a toddler. And so she thought it would, was Madeline. They cried 75 minutes on the Tuesday. That's uh, May 1st. And, uh, of course, this um, famous um, comment by Maddie that they, they said, you know, why didn't you come when we cried last night? That points to that being on the 2nd of May, right? But they used it. The McCann said it was on the morning of the 3rd to, to make us believe that she was alive on the 3rd. But when Jerry then says that she only cried one night, then it all falls apart. Then, it, of course, that comment, if it ever uh, was made by Manny, w- Manny, was on the morning before, on the May 2nd. So, um, um, so see Kate and Jerry... Is there any background reports on them before this with their kids or neglect or anything? Uh, this is uh, also this, this, the big question that I don't dig too deep into, you know, speculations and, and theories about why the cover-up um, of this. Um, because uh, Jerry McCann, there is a CATS file, um, 19039 something, um, uh, which is a sexual abuse file, but there's nothing on it. It's just on his name. I think actually it's on both parents' names, uh, this uh, cat's file. Um, so if you think about why would somebody help w- these families, uh, you know, and um, well, you could say there are many doctor families, you know, upper middle class, they're abroad, uh, and somebody knows Gordon Brown's brother or in the neighborhood or something, and, and he's on his way up. Uh, and of course, anybody would help, right? But um, the big question is why the gold steering group was established, I think only eight days after this. And what's that? Uh, it's like an, an emergency group set up by the, 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 the government um, to control things. And I think that's part of why Clarence Mitchell, the spokesperson, was sent down there to control what comes out in the media. That's his words. Um and, um, well, if there's a file on somebody and you have four families and they suspect possible SA um, within that group, uh, maybe it's worth uh, protecting something. I don't know. Uh, embarrassment? Uh, I don't know. I don't dwell into those things. But um, 12 days after this, I think the 15th or 16th of May, uh, Dr. Catherine Gaspar and her husband went to Leicestershire police and gave a statement. And this is the big one that points to the SA um, because it would be easier for her to let, let it go away, you know, but they actually stepped up to the police and they had been on holiday two years prior in 2005 in Mallorca with them. And then she had, uh, Catherine Gaspar, she had uh, witnessed David Payne and Jerry 
talk about Maddie in a sexual manner, that she likes this and doing certain gestures. And it happened twice. So her husband also noticed these things, but he, did, he, was, he didn't uh, catch it that it was about Madeline. But that's not the point. The point is you have somebody actually taking that risk, going to the police and giving that statement, but it was kept from the investigation, this insinuation of SA, um, which uh, gives a better image of why would they help them out of this trouble. So somebody knew something was going on. Um, you talking about Peter for your ring? I, I don't talk about ring. It could be just, uh, you know, inter friends, uh, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we're talking about the P thing, of course. So we go right back. So bef wh what date did Kate and Jerry arrive in Portugal? Oh, they were on April 28th. And they were only there, supposed to be there for one week, yes. holiday. Yeah. And their friends, seven friends, uh, three couples and one mother is yeah, that the correct of, yeah um and how many other kids were in the group oh uh, two plus two plus one plus three i don't know yeah why is none of those people ever gave interviews well they had this meeting of course and they they call it the pact of silence but it comes um this is the biggest question i get when i even from from big media guys germany uh built guy is that they cannot understand why they would lie for them. And, and this is, has also uh, tells you about the, the, the timing of things, the timeline. How, how far back can you pull it? Mm, not just all the mistakes that were done and, and uh, uh, that points to it being pretty uh, close up to the alleged uh, disappearance. Um, um, but... Um, it has to come a point of no return very quickly, right? For people not to turn on them. You know, you get part of it. And that's occulting the body, you moving the body, getting out of the, get the body out of the apartment before, uh, you know, cadaver scent starts to develop, they thought. Um, I'll get into that later, maybe if you pull it up. Uh, um, but um, um if I was their friend, you know, and uh, a <sighs> tragic uh, thing happens and then they risk losing the custody of the twins and their house and their jobs, I would lie for them. And I hate lying more than anything. Uh, but of course, not if SA is involved. You know, I, I, I make a joke about it in the book. Then I'll, I would have been in Portuguese, Portuguese jail mm -hmm. if somebody did that in my uh, surroundings. But um, uh, joke aside, you know. Yeah. Uh, um, but this is the thing. and But it comes also a point on no return where it's not about throwing the McCann's under the bus. I mean, seeing from the friend's point of view, uh, they started to lie for them. And then why haven't they turned? This is what the, I'm being asked all the time. Would these friends lie for them? And then you have the cover-up, you know. So now you're not throwing the, the McCann's under the bus. You're looking up at the government that want to protect the cover-up, and that is the big thing. So they can keep you in check very easily, you know, these friends. And they haven't spoken. So they had a meeting. It's called the secret meeting in Rothley. Pact of silence. Uh, I think David Payne may, may, may have used those words to the media. Um, and it's easier to sit still in the bus and let this. But they didn't, they had no clue this was going so big, you know. Uh, but in the night, you have a few glasses of wine. You have uh, one of the children in one of the locked apartments fall behind the sofa, cracks her head, and uh, one family is the lucky one, and that is where the, the chief in command, and he convinces everybody else that they're in the same boat and they got to help out. But they have already basically taken part, not all of them, of course, a few of them knowingly helping to get uh, rid of the body. And then... Uh, uh, for me, I found that uh, the place uh, was the cemetery. And this was based on Kate's words. And uh, yeah. Yeah, because if there's a child goes missing, you're going to be screaming it from the rooftops. You're going to be coming forward and everybody's going to be speaking out, doing as many interviews as you can, pleading for help. Yes. It just, that's where the question, that's why I think it's becoming so people are, it's not even conspiracy theories it's people are just so intrigued by it because it's so many question marks unanswered um 
the doctors, the kind of well-to-do people. But I'm going off course. But if you look at kind of Prince Andrew, mm -hmm. you look at Epstein. Epstein's a known fucking paedophile. Prince Andrew was still going to meet him. Why? Did they have something over him? It's the same as these people. If you're not coming forward and you're trying to do secret agreements and silent this and silence that, then what do they have over each other? And yeah. that's the questions. And I could be wrong as well, but it's just the way it looks. It doesn't look. It looks very suspicious. So we're there in, there in Portugal. Because even the videos, though, and like I say, you've got to give Kate and Jerry credit as well. Because even their videos of their kids and in their home, there seems to be lots of toys. The ki kids seem to be having fun. Like, they don't seem like bad parents. Obviously, they neglected their kids, obviously. But when you look at the interviews, Jerry's asked a question about do you feel bad for leaving your daughter? And he's saying, um, yeah, but m millions of people have messaged me saying they do the same thing. And it's like, justifying. You left your daughter. Admit you should never have done it. Two years old and three years old. There's kids in that room. Should never be left alone at that age because they can wake up any minute, any time. You could have put them in the pram and had them sit next to you. Um, it just, there's, like I say, we'll, we'll get into everything, but just seems messy. So you're saying the first time a holiday's going great, was there any suspicious from any other of the tourists with their behaviour or anything odd? You mean after that? No, during the holiday. You know, it's actually they don't speak about that, but that's because the media machine of the McCanns and Clarence Mitchell in charge of that, of course, is to speak only about what happened from May 3rd and onwards. Never look back. And this is basically... Uh, Kate, her, uh, she did it herself. She said she had to be like, uh, like uh, um, uh, I was going to say like a detective and making sure to fill all the gaps from May 3, right? Don't look back to May 2. But then again, she did a, a big mistake in my, in my opinion, because a mother having read to her child, you know, a bedtime story in that book, if you're happy, whatever, uh, and you have a chance to go back in time, what would you do? Every mother in the world would say that, I wish I was there in the bed reading for her and just, I didn't go for dinner that night, you know, because then she wouldn't have been taken. But what does Kate do? She wants to go back to the day before, only for one hour and take notes and watch them watching them, you see? So her priority is to convince us that somebody was looking to abduct a child hmm. instead of trying to avoid the abduction itself. Isn't that strange? Yeah. It shows the priority. It's self-preservation and conviction, you know, convincing us that there was someone uh, had been watching them days ahead. Mm -hmm. Because the thing that breaks my heart, I think it was the 2nd of May, um, well, they say it's the 2nd of May. Madeline was crying for over one hour. Um, Kate and Jerry's admitted that. The night before, yeah, why, no, two, why two nights earlier? Two nights earlier, yeah. on Tuesday, yeah, so, May first. Yeah, Madeline's crying for over one hour. Yeah. Kate and Jerry's admitted that. Why did you leave me? Why didn't you come when I called? But yet, the same night, they've done the same again. There is a interesting phone call uh, from Kate to a friend back home. I think she was a pathologist, and my interpretation of that information is that. When Mrs. Fenn upstairs had heard the crying increasingly for 75 minutes on uh, the Tuesday, May 1st, um, that uh, the next day, uh, these phone calls, that Kate wanted to increase the dosages, right? And it's been speculated about uh, overdose. And of course, it's, it affects a child climbing a sofa, uh, standing a, a meter away from the window because there's a big drop outside. It's like a safety pre precaution. Uh, and that she probably reached and you know we we might get into those technical things uh, later but uh that the the dosage thing and also the liquid in the rental car that was found uh, was said by Amaral to contain very high dosage of uh, sedatives um so um yeah um so if the kids, so they said they were checking on the kids every half hour, is that, is that incorrect? Yeah, but it, 
there's so many stories and they changed their stories about this this thing uh, um, because uh, there was an interviewer suggesting to Jerry that they checked every 15 minutes and then he says, whoa, hey, wait a minute. It's purported that we're checking every 30 minutes and they only checked on their own. And all of a sudden they have friends checking on them. We'll get into that too. But um, um, on this, this is interesting about the May uh, 2nd is that Russell listened outside of the bedroom window. This is uh, one of the big ones that catches it for me. Um, he's listening 11 p.m. on May 2nd. And he, um, and then uh, uh, um, Kate and Jerry, actually uh, Jerry had been uh, uh, watching football, the Champions League match with Man Manchester United, Milan. And um, Kate had been moaning and she probably gave a comment or something by the dinner table. So he ran off and she followed him by five minutes. This is their story, okay? Um, and um, they arrived at the apartment 11.45. So 45 minutes after Russell had checked. And then Kate also said that they didn't check for 45 minutes. And then she said, I, she... she uh, if she could only for one hour go back and to, to avoid the, she had this uh, statement in the video presentation you probably seen. But the interesting thing is that Russell, when he goes and gives a statement to Leicestershire a year after, and he's reading over his own statement, he says the following, I would like to remove uh, the word too. It was too well when he checked on 11 p.m. because it sounded ominous about something is about to happen, right? But why would he care about his check the day before if she was snatched the day after, you see? So he's very self-aware about not leading up to and telling because he knows that if he was too well, it can never be too well. It's either quiet or it's not, right? When you're checking on the children. So there's, there's so many fascinating aspects that I, of course, you know, the book is very thick, but the way I, I there's been a lot of uh, interesting people that has written books, done the analysis. Um, they haven't seen all the things that I see, but uh, it, it's about how you put it together and then you put the puzzles there in the right places and everything makes sense. And this is the amazing thing about the night before. Everything makes sense based on that. But I didn't decide that time and then make everything fit. It was more a surprise that everything uh, was pointing to this. And of course, when I was aware of that, basically from a comment of Jane Tanner, uh, then all of a sudden it appears. This is the thing about when you have a lot of material, it's very hard to find something. But when you look for something, you actually see it. And this is one of these things. And, and, and Jane Tanner's comment was, of course, about the football. They were doing this reconstruction and video. Who is she? Uh, Jane Tanner, the friend who saw... So the abductor. Get, she said she's seen someone carry yeah, a child at yeah. nine fifteen. Yes, and then she said that's the girl. Was at the tap past seven? They call them the seven friends who were yeah, at the tap past. Yeah. So Just Jane Tanner from the room. Yeah, yeah. So she uh, allegedly uh, walks past Jez Wilkins and uh, Jerry um, around the quarter after nine. You know, and uh, uh, she sees the abductor. But then she, in the reconstruction video, she says that if you would have been looking at me, she's talking to Jerry, I would have said something like, Kate's been moaning since you've been uh, gone a long time watching football. But there was no football then. There had been two Champions League the, on May 1st and the 2nd. And so Jane basically put me on, hey, let's look at the football. There was no football. There was some Europa League, uh, Sevilla uh, against somebody else. But then when you have Liverpool playing on the 1st and then Manchester United on the 2nd, you bet Jerry has been watching those two, right? So, so that's what started it with me. That was Jane's comment. And then when you see that reconstruction video, Jerry's reaction to that is like, whoa, that was something that didn't. And then she's crying after. But she's looking down at Jerry because she knew she stepped in the salad, you know. So the FUD of me is when Kate and Jerry says Madeline was abducted. Again, something sticks out as with when Kate went back to the room. As soon as Madeline wasn't there, she just started screaming, my daughter's been abducted. Now, bear in mind, the window's still open. She's still got her twins in the room. She's ran straight out and saying, Madeline's been abducted. Like, how can you just come to that conclusion straight away? Like, that doesn't stick out. Plus, you've got your other kids in the room. You would make sure they were protected. 
And even you would look about the room or the hotel for Madeline's missing, you would never come to the conclusion straight away that she's been abducted. So that stinks straight away. So is she saying she went to the room, the window was open, Madeline wasn't there? Is this what Kate's saying? Yeah. And then she went down to the restaurant and said, they've taken her. So who are they? And taking instead of saying Melingo, but she left the twins. This is the thing, without shutting and closing and locking the window first, which was cold, but uh so she left the twins and uh, went down. But, you know, this is the thing. It's it's so absurd that it only makes sense when you know the truth, you know, that they faked uh, the abduction the next day. I mean, on the third. And that she uh, Maddie had the accident on the late uh, night of uh, evening of uh, May 2nd. So when you talk about the accident, are you saying... Kate and Jerry's possibly drugged their kids to make them sleep so they can go and party because I know people have says Madeline's fell off the couch or the sofa, banged her head and passed away. Is that correct? Well, based on the, the forensic finding of the liquid in the rental car, but also how the twins were treated. You know, they've slept through the whole thing, the commotion uh, of everything with people coming into the bedroom and... Uh, People have uh, seen Jerry and Kate actually shaking the twins, but also I think Fiona and uh, Russell were sent to um, the bedroom to to check if the twins were breathing. So why wouldn't you take them to the doctor then to check if they suspected an abductor having sedated them? No, it's because they probably gave them more uh, from after the crying on the on the May first. Uh, that uh, they were afraid that somebody would discover that they were drugged, right? But the police took note of that, that they didn't. And of course, the parents suggested a drug test later after it was out of the system, weeks later, instead of doing it right away. So yeah. all the behavior, like you said, it's, it doesn't match anything. And, and people say, oh, but you don't know how it is to lose a child. And, but it's nonsense. You have the instinct. You close the window, you lock it, you go on the patio, if you want to leave the, 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 the room, the bedroom, just to shout across the pool, Jerry, or something. Just scream, Jerry, come. Right? See, for drugging the kids, is that so they can drink and party? Or is there a possibility they were drugging the kids and abusing them also? I, I don't speculate what's going on. And, uh, you know, I actually, it's, it's irrelevant. For me, it was like, um, I only wanted to find the remains. And then I had the timeline and, and that changes everything because it's all about uh, the impossible abduction. And Jane wasn't even there to see the tenement and how much weight they put on their own abductor. What do you need if you fake an abduction? You need somebody seeing someone carrying a child. It's ABC, right? These are not criminals, but that's what anybody could come up with. And, and, and that was the thing. And they kept... Uh, the nonsense of the tenement, even though Jane wasn't even there. Was there cameras at the hotel in this year, 2007? No. no. Why not? <laughs> it's Portugal. They don't have CCTV and it's illegal to film the street, the public areas. You could have on the internal hallways and stuff and maybe even there was somewhere, uh, some places on the more modern facilities, but you're not allowed to have like street view where anybody can be seen, I think. But that's a perfect yeah, yeah, yeah. spot then yeah, for yeah. pedophiles and criminals then. Yeah, yeah. Because that was that area not a kind of hot zone for um, predators? Nah, this is... Or is that just fabricated? Yeah, no, I mean, in history, you could probably... There were some cases about this, but the thing about uh, the rumors that the law wasn't protecting children enough there and stuff, I don't know. I'm sure there were... Uh, I, I, I haven't done research on all that, but I know what's been said uh, about pedophile rings operating there. It's like in any uh, lower development countries, like, you know, like pre-EU Portugal, probably. Mm. But uh, this, I, I don't speculate too much about these things. What about, so she screamed abduction, but uh, there's apparently phone calls. Instead of phoning the police or the hospital, she's contacted the media in the UK. How true is that? Well, what they did, they went to the bedroom and they didn't even search physically themselves. And they were deleting text messages. And especially from the day before, I heard uh, from May 2nd. But surely they can be, and early. they can still be searched if they've deleted them or not. Yeah, 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 yeah. No, I mean, that's uh, all sorted. But what the, the point is, if your parents uh, 
first of all, the initial search, you had Jerry pretending to search in the playground area at the hotel, even though they said Jane hadn't said that she saw someone carrying a child away on the backside. But that's the only direction they would search, right? But then Jane said that uh, she didn't tell, they didn't tell uh, about her observation until 1 a.m., which is absurd, right? They're looking and she's missing and she saw something. And then her story, I mean, Jane told Russell, her, her man, that uh, she had never been more certain of anything in her life. So why wouldn't she say that right away then? It doesn't make sense. But this about is what? fiction that, what? that she saw someone take Madeline yeah. away, right? Mm -hmm. um, so so it's it's absurd. So but, do you believe that's made up? Just yeah, yeah, off? yeah. The problem was the timeline. She was supposed likely to go because they had two written timelines which was a rehearsal for the next day. It wasn't to help the police. And Matt had an inside check, allegedly, and it was on the first written timeline, but it was removed on the second written timeline. It was like open space. So I think he hesitated to go and check and not look around the corner to see if Maddie was there. It didn't make sense to him. But they wanted somebody, a third person, check between the father and the mother, right? Before the alarm. But it was also, I think, implemented to push the alarm a half hour later to 10 p.m. because they were searching around 9.30 p.m. So they adjusted this very strangely. And this is why Matt, uh, I think, is, is a weak link here. I mean, he's active part of the lie, of course. Um, but, um, but he didn't want, but they convinced him um, during the next night, I mean, the, the May 3rd night, to go to the police on the 4th and say that he actually did that inside check which he didn't, and I can prove it. What time did they report it to the police? Yeah, it was like 10.41. And do you believe the incident happened on the Tuesday? Yeah, the, the yeah, day the before? Accident, yes. Do you believe she was dead the day before? Yes. And they've cleaned it up? Yes. No, nobody can verify that they never seen her on the FUD? Or, do you know what I'm saying? If they're saying she was there on the FUD, she was abducted on... That's Nighttime. the only thing, it's the last photo. No one ever yeah. came forward to say she wasn't playing it. Because there must have been a play part. There must have been this other is families. The, this is the nanny uh, story. And this is what, so here's what happened. When uh, 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 Christian Bruckner, the, the German suspect, was pulled out of the hat, I sent an anonymous email to uh, the prosecutor, the state attorney in Germany, and to uh, his defense lawyer, uh, Friedrich Filscher. And uh, Friedrich respons uh, responded, and he came down, and he was in my mezzanine reading my first draft of the book, Four Days. And then he said, if they charge him, uh, I want you next uh, to me in court in Germany, and we'll take these uh, people in for questioning, uh, the top us nine. And they have to answer, uh, sit alone in the, in, in the center and answer a German judge. And uh, the German prosecutor, he didn't respond, uh, Walters. So, um, um, I lost my thread. <laughs> yeah, you were yeah. talking about the German man, and the, the, you showed him your draft of the book, and the tap past nine could have been charged. We spoke about, um, did anybody see Madeline on the third playing at the park or anything? Yeah, the, yeah. well, okay. Uh, back to the, um, uh, the last photo, um, which wasn't the last photo, the poolside photo, which is called the last photo, the poolside photo with Jerry and, uh, and Maddie and uh, one of her siblings. Um, so that was likely taken on the Sunday. So the only, um, um, well, okay, this is about Friedrich Filscher. So the biggest bomb for him was what I did with the nanny, breaking that down, because she was, of course, the witness that said that we were on the beach with Maddie on the Thursday, okay? But she did something, and this is also very interesting in terms of statement analysis, because uh, Kat Baker, the nanny, she said that I and Nanny, uh, I and Maddie, uh, and four or five other lobster children went down to the beach. Why would she would she be uncertain if there were five or six total children going down to the beach? You're a nanny. You do a head count. You know exactly, and you've been the whole week with them. And there were six children signed in. So why would she be uncertain to being five or six? That was a big lead for me. And then I saw chronologically what she claimed have happened at the beach. And this is interesting because the first time she was asked on May 6th, she said that Maddie never cried and, and or showed discontent with anything, okay? 
And this is very interesting. So this is May May sixth. So the PJ they were very close to this uh, to solving this case if they had paid attention in terms of her uncertainty about how many children were on the beach on the third. So the tenth they took her back in for questioning only about this mini sailing thing uh, on the beach. And uh, and uh, and she told them what happened and and all these things, um, but no crying. Okay. But then she, uh, they had this uh, secret meeting in Rothley, the group, uh, um, in uh, November, uh, uh, October, October or November. But on um, yeah, maybe eighteenth November. But twenty fifth of November, the cat, uh, cat, uh, the nanny, she visits the McCanns in their private home. And here's the thing: she is questioned by the Leicestershire police eight months, uh, six months later, on April two thousand and eight. And there she adds the information about crying, Maddie crying on her lap on the beach on the Thursday, May 3rd. So she's adding new information, totally contradicting her first statements. So there's a there's a there's a there's a strategy here. And this is one of my biggest discoveries that Friedrich Fulcher, the lawyer, um, discovered, uh, which was the big revelation for him. That's why I, I mentioned that um at this point. Because um and I was shocked to see that actually this re-questioning that happened in Leicestershire uh, Police on April 2008 was demanded by Team McCann. It was they handpicked 25 witnesses that, uh, that would testify that they were innocent, right? It was like a whitewashing campaign. And Kat was on that list, even with a specifically designed question. They, they sorted these people into groups and what question to ask them to make them look good, of course, Tima Kat. But Kat was the key here. She wanted to ask, and she was asked about crying, even though she had said, Maddie never cried. And then this thing, and she had just visited the McCann's at their home. This is priming. Of course, this is my theory, but you can look at the chronology and you see the logics, and then you see her adding the crying incident on the beach. So this is the only witness. There was the other witness that said that she had read on the lap, but according to their sh the crash records, you can see that she's talking about a different day. This is another. Nanny. So there's only one witness to say Basically, she, she was still alive on the third. Yes, but it doesn't really mean anything because she, exactly she, she's connected to the McCanns. Yes. So when the police get called, the police come out. What are they thinking straight away? Are they obviously back in the McCanns. Yeah, they actually were puzzled by the window that was supposed to be jimmied and broken open, and they couldn't find anything there. So I think they were already onto them. But it was the behavior of the McCanns that they found strange too, that. When they arrived, the first police arrived, you had Kate and uh, Jerry, very controlled person, falling to their feet, uh, crying with her face to the ground. But that's probably to hide that that's crying without tears. I have a chapter on that in the book. And they did the same thing in the bedroom where the cadaver dog marked. The, the parents' bedroom, when the police entered there, they were... They would, they used the words like praying Arabs. Actually, this was the police description of it, like face down on the bed. Uh, I don't know if they were kneeling next to the bed, but crying to keep the police out of there. And then later you have a cadaver positive marking by the cabinet oh. there. So um, Because the young waiter, he gave a statement and says everybody else was more distraught than Kate and Jerry. Now, like we spoke earlier, people react to things differently. Not everyone's the same, but he says they reacted. They never showed much emotion. And the fact that he says they were playing tennis Two days later, they were out running three days later. Now, I've actually asked people who were on this podcast, and I messaged them and says, look, I don't want to... I said, I'm sorry for asking, but after you'd, your son went missing, or your daughter went missing, um, did you ever do any sort of fitness training instantly or a week later? They said, no, not for like months later. So this wasn't just one or two people. This was like five, six people I messaged. Um, just to get a rough understanding to see the sort of movements after a kind of... This is the worst thing that any parent can ask for. So like you say, they're doctors as well. And it's to understand them and try to look at it from all angles. But the way they were acting to then washing the teddy bear. Now that's your daughter's teddy bear who you think has been abducted. The last thing you ever want to do is wash that. Because I'm, some of these people who I've interviewed, they've never changed the bedrooms of their yeah, kids yeah, ever. Yeah. 10 years later, 20 years later. I know a girl who had a miscarriage. She's got a shrine 
of her baby photos and scan photos in yeah. the living room of that baby and um, she's four or five years later she still feels distraught so it just doesn't sit well with a, as a parent myself the reaction but again to look at it from their point of view their doctors are cold maybe they've seen dead bodies deaths their whole life with the, the medical industry they're in but it just doesn't it just doesn't sit right well it it makes totally sense if you are aware of uh, you have hidden the body and that there's cadaver scent possibly or some other scent you don't want the police to discover when you hear that the dogs are underway which they knew and that's why she washed it so it, it makes completely sense that she washed it and what it about, doesn't make sense when you and what about the dogs that came straight away when did they come uh, yeah these dogs they were they came in july um end of july and um, so may june August. so three months later yes so did so if someone's been abducted surely they're going to call dogs in straight away to follow the scent no yeah they, they used that and they had the scent dogs you know on the clothes but uh, no the, cad cadaver never lead anywhere dog. no no they said that some traces stopped at the baptista right below down the street uh, which is normal. They probably walk there every day. So, uh, yeah, nothing. I think even they actually, uh, yeah, checked the cemetery as well with these dogs for clothes if she was hidden there. And and that's where she was, actually. Um, yeah, uh, what I was going to tell you, um, the, the inconsistency is one, one important thing. You say you said about uh, neglect, about locking children in. So you have four families, and the story was uh, that the other three uh, families they locked their their apartments, right? But keep in mind, the first statement by Jerry was that uh, the, he and Kate used the key to the front door when they went and checked, okay? Uh, he's, uh, he's questioned on May 4th, uh, two or three hours before Kate. But then he discovers that if, that if he sticks to that story and the shutters are open, then Kate, to get to the front door, would discover that the bedroom window shutters were open. She has to walk right past it. So he's thinking, oh my goodness, right? So she changes the story. So she, uh, two, three hours later, she says that they used the patio door. And she says that that was unlocked the whole week. But then Jerry later, he says they opened the patio doors. I mean, like unlocked the back patio doors from the Wednesday, May 2nd, in case friends were to check. Okay, are you following me? But then he said, I think David went to check. And David says he didn't check. So they opened, according to Jerry, they op uh, unlocked the pack patio doors in case friends were to check from the Wednesday. Why was that important? Because he knew that police had discovered there was no point of entry or exit in the bedroom window that they said was broken open. So he was adapting his story to them, they needed a new point of entry and exit for an abductor. So that's when he said. So they totally, uh, they didn't align at all. She said they were unlocked the whole week, and he said they they opened them, uh, unlocked it on the Wednesday. With uh, Madeline going missing, there's kids going missing every couple of minutes all around the world. Why did it get so much media coverage? Uh, well, they paid for it. But surely they wouldn't have wanted that because it would have been easier to fly under the radar, no? Well, actually, I think it's because actually Sky News, they caught the story immediately. Oh, she was kidnapped on the morning. Very early morning, you had the big news. That helps. But to continue that, they actually, um, they were complaining during the Levison hearing, which maybe we should also say that Jerry gave us the green light to, to purport theories about this because he's a defender of freedom of speech. He said that during that inquiry. And uh, they were complaining about uh, the media attention. But then, of course, the, uh, was it uh, Bell Pottinger, uh, the owner? He said that the McCanns, he, did, he didn't care because they paid him uh, half a million pounds to be on the papers, on the front uh, papers uh, every day for a year. So how can you complain of being in the media if you pay half a million pound of... Uh, <laughs> Jerry was donated paid. money. Were they getting paid money? No, they, uh, no, they paid Bell Pottinger, the Madeline Fund, the search fund, which was never a fund. It was a limited um, company, you know, um, because uh, if it was a, a real fund, it, the money donated would have, be used, have to be used on all missing children or several, not only on the Madeline case, even though they probably spent 12, 15% maximum on this hiring 
dubious investigators from uh, Barcelona and what, what have you to appear to be looking for their daughter. How uh, much has actually been funded into the Madeleine McCann oh, case? Oh, I don't have a clue and I don't care, you know. Are you talking 30, 40 million people are saying? Yeah. N huh? How much? 30 and 40 million. Oh, I have no clue. I didn't think it was that much. But the 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 government has funded the Operation Grange and all that that money. That's probably close to 14 million now. And uh, I don't think that money went to the Madeleine Fund, but that's private donations go there. It's a pub. You have the access to see the numbers, but uh, I don't care about those things. So, what are the police saying? Once which police? The Portuguese police. Yeah, they. What are they saying the next day? When did they start raising alarms? Because I know I've got it written down here. Yeah, Amaral. Uh, he was on, yeah, on the so window. The, yeah. the senior detective Amaral. He believes that they covered it up. Kate yes. and Jeremy can, and they have always been suspects in Portugal. Is that correct? Yes. So even the final con uh, the the final con uh, conclusion by uh, the Almeida, it was basically uh, same as uh, Amaral, you know, that the, the body was hidden by the parents. And who as Amaral? He was the chief detective, the first one on, on the case, and when running did the, the investigation. And when did the alarm bell start? Well, actually, the, the, the he Portuguese was... Portuguese police. Yeah, he was, he was on to them, he, not officially, but I think within 48 hours, he knew that something was off with them. And, uh, and even you had... Uh, um diplomat's office uh, actually sent to the home office a letter i don't know if it, i think it was the diplomat himself i, I i'm not sure um but this uh, i i i mentioned it in the book because it leaked uh to a belgian newspaper but he, he was worried about are you are, are you sure we're going to help them and with everything they would need because they're not cooperating with the police that was the, the the letter of worry from the diplomat, uh, from the, the ambassador to Portugal. That's what I'll read out because when you said they're not cooperating with the police. Yeah. It's so, listen, if you've lost a daughter or abducted, apparently, you're going to be, like I says, Ella, screaming from the rooftops, doing everything you can. You've clearly got nothing to hide. And I understand the police might have made them suspects so or they might have been told by the lawyers, listen, don't say anything. But... There was 48 questions that Kate McCann didn't answer about the disappearance of her daughter, Madeleine McCann. One, on May 3rd, 2007, around 10 o'clock, you entered the apartment. What did you see? What did you do? Where did you look? What did you touch? Again, never answered. So all these questions she never answered. The second, did you search inside the master bedroom wardrobe? What were your exact words? Three, shown to photographs of her bedroom wardrobe can you describe its contents for why was the curtain by the sofa near the side window tampered with did someone go behind the sofa five how long did your search of the apartment take after you detected madeline's disappearance six why did you say madeline had been abducted seven assuming madeline was abducted why did you leave the twins to go to the tapas and mm. raise the alarm mm. the supposed abductor could still be in the apartment eight why didn't you ask the twins then what happened to their sister? Or why didn't you ask them later on? Nine, when you raised the alarm at the tapas, what exactly did you say? What were your exact words? Ten, what happened after you raised the alarm there? Eleven, why did you go and warn your friends instead of shouting from the veranda? Twelve, who contacted the authorities? In fact, I'll not even read out the numbers, but I'll just read the questions yeah. that she never asked. Mm. Who took part in the searches? Did anyone outside the group learn of her disappearance in those following minutes? Did any neighbour offer you help? What does we let her down mean? Did Jane Tanner tell you the night she'd seen a man with a child? Yeah. How are the authorities contacted and which police force were alerted? During the searches with the police there, where did you search for Maddie? How and what way? Why did the twins not wake up during the search or when they were taken upstairs? Who did you phone after the occurrence? Did you call Sky News? Did you know the danger of calling the media because it could influence the abductor? Did you ask for a priest? By what means did you divulge Madeline's features by photographs or by any other means? Is it true that during the searches you remained seated on Maddie's bed without moving? What was your behaviour that night? Did you manage to sleep? Before travelling to Portugal, did you make any comment about the 
foreboding or bad feeling or a bad feeling? What was Madeline's behaviour like? Did Maddie suffer from any illness or take any medication? What was Madeline's relationship like with her brother and sister? What was Madeline's relationship like with her brother and sister, friends and schoolmates? As for your professional life and how many as for you, professional life and how many and which hospitals have you worked? What is your medical sp- speciality? Have you ever done shift work in any emergency services or other services? Did you work every day? At a certain point you stopped working, why? Are the twins difficult to sleep? Are they restless and does this cause you unease? Is it true sometimes you despaired at your children's behaviour? and it le- left you feeling very uneasy. Is it true in England you even considered handling Madeline over to custody to a relative? In England, did you medicate your children? What type of medication did you use? In the case files where you, you were shown ca- canine, canine forensic testing films, after watching them, did you say you couldn't explain any more than you already had? When the sniffer dog also marked human blood behind sofa. Did you say you couldn't explain any more than you already had? When the sniffer dog marked the scent of a corpse coming from the vehicle you hired a month after the disappearance, did you say you couldn't explain any more than you already had? When human blood was marked on the boot of the vehicle, did you say you couldn't explain any more than you already had? When confronted with the results of Maddie's DNA carried out in a British lab, collected from behind the sofa and boot of the vehicle, did you say you couldn't explain any more than you already had? Did you have any responsibility or intervention in your daughter's disappearance? Now, she never a- answered any of those questions, which is so important for your kid's background, exactly where she was before, yeah. previous, and just, it doesn't, it makes sense now to not answer those questions. Now, I understand they became suspects, so they've got to be careful because they could be getting charged with murder. But if you've got nothing to hide, you don't you're care. Answering you don't every care one about of those risk. questions. Exactly. So, you don't care about the risk at all. Yeah. If you're and innocent. Some of those questions yeah. are quite in depth of did you medicate your yeah. child? And there's talks of her giving Madeline away. But there's a, there's a big problem with that, it makes completely sense. Keep in mind the first statements, Jerry was sitting behind her during the the questioning and squeezing her shoulder and you know having bodily contact that was the first questioning where she was alone this was when they were made our guidos like suspects mm-hmm. and of course Clarence Mitchell he said that it was advised you know not to incriminate yourself but who cares if you're a mother you don't give, you know you would be on top of the shoulders ask me more questions you would just answer anything mm-hmm. you know just get on with it and any any parents in a situation where a small child has been missing, you know that over 80%, you know, it's near family. Mm -hmm. You want to be excluded as soon as possible so they can put the resources in finding her, right? So, of course, you're you're spot on. Um, But for me, it was she couldn't answer those things because then more of the uh, incongruence between uh, she and Jerry would be visible. On the other ones, you could see the statements, the first statements, they have certain paragraphs that are almost identical, like rehearsed. Um, um, So... Which they were, of course. But they stayed in Portugal for an, another four months. That must go good for them, though, as well, that they stayed there because they could have went home, no? Well, d- yes, but, you know, they said immediately we're going to stay until we find her. And then, uh, of course, the the Friday they were made our guidos. They already had a flight on Monday, the next Monday, gone. Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, and hiring extradition lawyers, <laughs> you know. But, so, but surely, like you, we can speculate. But if they did drug their child, that Madeline's passed away, to get rid of the body for everybody to lie for them for seventeen years, and you've got to go. Well, possibly we could get it wrong as well. Like we could be wrong. It's not everything one hundred percent. We are saying we're only going by what we're reading, the information we have, statements. Uh, interviews that we can watch but it just seems why the big lie why the big cover up with it why well uh, first of all let's look at the forensics you know obviously there was a dead body in apartment 5a and uh, the sofa 
when you look at the, the thing that got uh, Amaral onto this also in, in, sev- in very few days was that there was staging involved about the beds. Um, the sofa, for instance, in the living room was pushed up against the window, which is a huge hazard. If you have a little air opening in the window and the child climbs the sofa, it can fall. There's a big drop on the outside. So they had a safety precaution. That sofa was normally 75 centimeters to a meter away from the window. And that's likely why she actually had the accident there and died. Because normally in a home, you are, you know, you're in your grandparents, you climb the sofa and basically you're in the window. You can almost touch the window, right? And then she leaned over. But in terms of Maddie being sedated, uh, you can fall off a sofa without the sedation. So those things for me are also not relevant because you can be scared, you climb the sofa and you fall anyways. Even though, of course, it, it's a factor, for example, if you're not sedated, you could catch yourself with the arms better. You have a low lighting condition in that living room. Imagine the sofa being almost a meter away. You're climbing up the sofa and you're leaning over. And you're hearing something in the street because there probably was a gap in that window for air. And then you lean over. And then if you're sedated, you can't catch yourself. And then I think, because normally a child shouldn't die from that height of fall down on hard tiles. Uh, they're pretty bouncy, uh, bouncy, these uh, small children. I saw statistics of that. Um, you normally survive that. Um, but I, my interpretation of that, there being a little blood on the windowsill and stuff, that maybe she, she got limp. I mean, she was uh, unconscious from hitting her head on the windowsill, the granite, the marble uh, sill, and then was limp on the, the, the next 90 centimeters down to the ground. And she could have been in a position where she can't breathe, and, and, and you could speculate. But the point was that the cat of our dog uh, marked there, and also Keela, the, the blood-sniffing dog, human blood-sniffing dog, and they found blood underneath the tile. And, um, and it's very curious that uh, you have a family of doctors, and uh, there were only two toothbrushes, and there were three children. And um, for me, that's kind of obvious. They used Maddie's uh, toothbrush to clean the, between the grut with bleach, right? Um, and uh, blood was found under the tiles with uh, 15 out of 19 markers, which in some countries is enough to, 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 uh, for a conviction. But um, yeah, so there's no, no doubt that uh, the forensics tell us that there was an accident behind that sofa. Um, How did it know that was Madeline's blood? 15 out of 19 markers of Madeline's uh, DNA was on that blood. Yeah. When did the British police get involved? Yeah, I think they were around pretty quickly, you know, and Clarence Mitchell, he was there fairly shortly. And there was uh, Amaral, he says there was MI5, MI6 around. They're always around for different reasons, you know, uh, in the area. Uh, Why? There was something in Alvor, I don't know, it had something Northern Ireland uh, thing going on. Still, I don't know. That's not my territory at all. Mm -hmm. But that's what I read, that there was something going on in in Alvor about uh, weapons uh, smuggling and stuff like that. So um, that was not a surprise. So the two dogs that were involved was some of the best dogs in the world. Yes. Uh, Keela, Eddie and Keela. Eddie and Keela, yeah. So Eddie was for the cops that could smell dead bodies. Keela yeah. could smell blood. Human blood, yeah. And blood was found in the room and the car. So the car, so the way it looks then, if they have smelled a corpse in the car 25 days later after Madeline, Madeline possibly dead in the room. If there's blood, they've got rid of the body. If they, see, the only thing is, surely they must have still been getting surveillanced or watched to then get a car go and pick up the body again, put the body in the back of the car and then take it somewhere else. It does seem a bit far-fetched. But if you had some surveillance GPS, well, all you would see is, uh, you know, after my theory is that they they rented the car to uh, re- move, move her from the cemetery up to the final place they had prepared on the hill. Um, and uh, yeah. So why was there never a conviction of blood in the room and a corpse in the car. This is the thing that the, the story uh, based on these findings that uh, PJ presented to the state attorney is that they they uh, it it couldn't have been done in such short time. Or I actually don't know what what they concluded with him. This is my speculation about them thinking that they couldn't have aligned their statements and and um, and keep in mind the DNA that was uh, um, later. Um, but um, they couldn't convince them for prosecution. But here's the thing. 
at that time, the big politics had already come into play. They had pushed Amaral out of the case because he was onto them. He would have finished it, but he wasn't allowed to finish the job. So he was transferred to the main office in the Faro, in the Algarve main office, which he later resigned to write the book, The Truth of, of the Lie. And they went after him, of course. Um, so he wrote the book, but did they not sue him? They sued him, yeah. And then he lost in the first one, and then he appealed. And then they appealed his appeal win to the Supreme Court, and they lost the McCanns. And then they, uh, they went against Portugal in the Human Rights Court and lost there as well, of course. Um, and uh, yeah. In his book then, he basically exposed them by saying that they were suspects? He basically, actually what we've been talking about, the findings behind the sofa, the blood, the DNA, and especially the, the findings in the rental car. I didn't read his book actually, but I've seen documentaries. I know what he's talking about. And, um, and that they, uh, the body was removed and that the friends are part of the cover-up by knowing and lying in the statements. There was a, a, a rumor um, that the PJ, they, they, uh, they were very clever, um, if this is correct. They were trying to, uh, con uh, to charge the friends, um, Jane, Matt, Russell, and Dave, for lying because they had their statements. So they knew if you have four statements that don't align, you have to decide who lied about what, right? And that's an impossibility to sort that out. So all lied. Um, and in November, they, uh, the rumor was that they were going to 2007 to charge those friends for lying um, about the case or taking part of the occult, uh, the, the moving of the body, or I don't know what the charges would have been. Uh, I'm not a legal expert in any way. Um, and, uh, but they, they didn't want to play that game the state attorney, because that would have solved everything. They wouldn't have lied under oath uh, and it would have been uh, exposed, the lie, between these four friends. And this is also why Kate couldn't answer the 48 question without Jerry there, because they could never align their statements about these details, especially about what did you see, what did you do, you know, about the history and back home. They were normal husband and wife. They would answer the same thing, I guess, about her medical condition and stuff. But they... They refused to hand over her medical papers to the Portuguese prosecution, Maddie's um, Why? files, I don't know. Uh, the media, you, they talk about her eye defect, you know. Uh, the parents are actually honest. They say that uh, she had a fleck on the iris, but uh, the media used coloboma. Uh, I'm st I've studied optometry, so I know the difference. And if you have a slit in the, uh, uh, in the pupil, uh, you would need sunglasses because you can't shut uh, the light out. You would be highly light sensitive. But anyways, uh, I don't know why they didn't want to. Uh, uh. What about the German pedophile who was in the area in 2007 who yeah. had previous of these crimes, uh, Christian B. Yeah. Bruckner. Yeah. Like, because obviously he's never been charged 2020, he became prime suspect, but he was in the area in 2007. I think he had a camper van and stuff as well. Yeah. What's the story with him? Well, he was basically checked out by the PJ, by Amaral. Uh, I mean, they didn't do, go through everything, but they sorted him out. But uh, Friedrich Filscher, uh, the lawyer, his lawyer, who came down and, and visited me, uh, I took him to Faro, to the courts there, uh, because he, had, he has an alibi, basically. Or let's call it a semi-alibi. Um, he had a girlfriend at that time, that week, he was uh, driving to Carwero, like a uh, 40 minute drive, and uh, meeting his girlfriend who was with her parents. She was 18 years old, a German girl. But the reason she hasn't stepped forward is that she's married today and has a child with the guy she was cheating on uh, in Germany. So um, we tried to go to the courts to find out who she was because she was caught uh, with a pepper spray when she returned. So. Uh, she will eventually, I mean, if he, if he w would have been charged, which he won't be, um, because Voltress now has read the book and he knows that that's, uh, you know, uh, 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 it will create enough doubt and that's a hurdle he cannot uh, surpass, you know, so charging him. So, so that's going to fall apart. But this, this young lady, uh, um, yeah, she had this uh, yeah, so he went uh, before midnight. He was in Carwero with his van 
every night. So imagine if he took Madeline around 9.30 or 9, 15, 20, and then he goes and have sex with his girlfriend that he had the whole week and she didn't notice there was something with him or da, da, da. That doesn't make sense. So, and you have the time, you could probably narrow it down to that being a very good alibi actually, you know, even though it's a semi alibi because he could have stuck her away, hidden her somewhere and you can speculate if he had taken her. But the German prosecution, they obviously didn't know the police files at all, but they were handed by Operation Grange. This was a setup. And Amaral, he was in a podcast in, South, uh, in Australia with Mark Sonokonoko. Um, and he said a year and a half before that, he said, there is a German guy. They've pinpointed him out as the patsy and they're going to bring him out. And they did. But I, I'm not going to say the Germans are naive, but they're like Norwegians naive you know you assume also that if he's the last man standing he's got to be the one right so operation grange they served uh, him to the germans and they took him hook line and sinker and pole and boat and ocean and everything and uh and he was convinced it was him and he did a mistake on volters the german district uh, state attorney uh, he went on a podcast in the second round of uh, Mark Sonokonoko's podcasts from uh, Australia. Um, and then he got caught uh, with his pants <laughs> on his ankles because he asked him, uh, was there a, a mobile phone mast at the resort, at the Ocean Club? Because here's the thing about resort. You have the American term and the British term. So Praia de Luz is a resort in English, right? It wouldn't be that in American language, right? And he, this is a German guy with, uh, you know. Um, so he thought when they used, uh, when they said there was a mobile antenna at the resort, they were thinking Pride de Luz. He thought it was the Ocean Club. So he thought he could pinpoint him there. And then he, in this podcast, said, are you sure there's a mobile antenna on, at, on the, and then he, the, the Volters, he has to, to ask his translator. And then you can almost, you can watch them on the radio, you know, how his, how he goes pale. He understands he messed up. So it turns out there was one mobile mast. I think it was on the water tower, not the one that they're showing on the documentaries down by the beach. Because I had an apartment there and I saw these antennas and uh, they were blocking my view and I sold the apartment. <laughs> I yeah. put it up for sale right that they put it up. That's recent. But that was a radius of five, six kilometers so that you can't place him there. And Mark Williams Thomas, the, the journalist, the former police investigator, he basically also found... found some witnesses that he was half an hour away or something when it when it allegedly happened i mean the the fake abduction of course yeah mark does some good work yeah he's done work on like jimmy savo joe nando yeah i think there was a boy there jay slater he's just been found dead and yeah i've seen he, he was down there yeah yeah he's done a lot of good work what about did he not have emails deleted in 2007 this christian this the is the, guy? this is the last lie they had in the media this is so dishonest basically this is uh they said he deleted his Hotmail uh, hot hot account in the early months of like January or February in 2007. How can that link to a future abduction? It's nonsense. And they don't know what that was. It's just that he deleted his. So this, is, this was a spin. It was a lie. I actually asked Freddy Fulcher, what's with these emails? And he said, they don't exist. So if he was to ever get, has he ever been charged, Christian, with? No, no. So if he was to get charged, do you think that then puts all the speculation to bed about Kate and Jerry? Uh, if he was to get charged with abduction and murder? Well, that would be amazing. Because uh, his defense will use that brick in that case. But it won't happen now that Voltres is aware of that. So I sent him a book. The I don't think it would ever happen anyway because they've been he's been a suspect yeah, yeah, for years. a long time. But the evidence, this is also the second word about the language, about the, he, he said material evidence. You know, I'm trying to defend Walters here. And this is also what I asked Freddie Filcher, his lawyer. I said, there's something with the language because I said, what is uh, uh, material evidence in German? Well, if you have a hearsay, a witness statement, and it's signed and it's a paper, physical paper, that's material evidence in the German language, but it's not in, in, in English language. That's DNA, hair, you know, cor uh, corroborating witnesses and all that stuff, pinpointing you at some place. So he has nothing. And the other thing was uh, that he had, 
was that uh, uh, Christian Bruckner had went on a chat, uh, gaming chat, you know, and saying that he dreamt about kidnapping and uh, killing and abusing a child several years later. Number one, if you had been in Amaral's scope in the biggest missing person case in history, you wouldn't chat like that and you've been cleared from that case. You would not, for, first, of, first of all, you wouldn't dream about something you already did and you wouldn't go out in this semi-public chat forums and express that, right? And uh, yeah, and the last thing about the emails, actually, uh, Peter McLeod, uh, former superintendent at Nottingham Police from 72 to 2000, he thinks the timing is, uh, has to do with uh, my book, this last uh, lie about the email, because uh, the journalist from Built, Kai Felthaus, he was in court that day and he said, the guy who planted and they, they, they mistranslated German words or whatever, because it wasn't said in the court that day when they put up this deletion of this, uh, deleting of this uh, Hotmail account or emails um, in early 2007, several months before she disappeared and it connects him to her. How can something connect him to, when you don't know those emails, what they were? If it was a hypothetic, hypothetical email they found, which said, I am going to do ABC, then it's like, hey, wait a minute. But it still doesn't connect. But that, they never existed. They never knew what they was, just that he had deleted emails. But that was a tactical move. It's speculated by Peter McLeod because of my book, the timing of it. What about the interviews when people read on their body language? Because so many people came forward and said there's just something not right with the, the way they speak, the way they handle themselves. Like the body, the body language experts have kind of, it just doesn't sit right with them either. Yeah. Can I, can I say oh, something first can. to finish up, Christian yeah, yeah, Bruckner? Yeah. Because the other thing they had, the German prosecution, which actually is kind of interesting and almost funny if it was true, which it could be true. So let's say it was true that this Helge Bushing, which uh, the PJ called Helge Bullshit, I'm sorry, he's sick now, and uh, well, he, he wanted money to, to give his, uh, his statements and stuff. So there was two things that he said. Number one was that Christian Bruckner had said that I know everything about that case. So keep in mind, imagine you're a skinny uh, you know, criminal coming back to Germany from Portugal. That's, I would say that I, I know everything about that case, you know, because you... It depends on what you mean about everything. It's about what's in the media, you know, she disappeared, search. It doesn't mean that he took her, right? And also a criminal would also, to build cred, maybe say something to impress or something, right? So that doesn't have any weight anyways. But the, the, the other thing was, was before this email, the, the, the one prior was that he said, and she didn't cry. This was so big. And as soon as I heard that, I talked to Friedrich Filcher, his lawyer, and I said, well, that's very strange that the media makes it look, him look guilty because it's actually the opposite. He's adding to the mystery. So follow this. So if Helge Bushing says that, oh, and she didn't wake up, he's talking when some stranger picks up Maddie from her bed, right? And then uh, Chris, uh, Christian B follows up with, yeah, and she didn't cry, you know? So contextually, he's adding to the mystery, but it's taken out of context by the media, like saying, and she didn't cry when I took her. Just uh, this uh, lately, some of these media have added the parenthesis, like almost like when I took her. It wasn't there, right? It's just that they're speculating about she didn't wake up and cry when the, somebody took her. The media still make money from this. Yeah, yeah, yeah. They're spending it. So, the, But this would do the two big things and it, it's nothing, right? So of course he cannot be charged. And like he said, also Walters now recently, he said that no one in the world can find more. He said basically what they have found. And then, yeah, well, um, and uh, the case will be closed if they don't find anything else. So basically that's in the, the next. But uh, Christian B, he was charged for uh, two rapes. This is also very strange, these two rapes that he's charged for now, for five cases. They're opening again in August 5th. Um, and the judges actually lifted the arrest warrants for all of them, five, because of the lack of evidence. So imagine this, these two rapes. Helge Bushing had seen video where he rapes two young women, a teenager, two teenagers or something, right? Uh, in court, that doesn't even have any weight when you don't know who it is and they state that they were raped because it could be a role play that is abused to impress, right? 
to create doubt in a court. It's easy to be a defense lawyer. Hey, no, it was just a role play. I don't know. I haven't seen this video. So like, I'm speculating. And the other two was exposure. Maybe he changed his clothes close to a, a playground. I'm not trying to make him. He's a pedophile and a beast or whatever. I don't care. I don't want to meet him. I have nothing to do with him. Uh, but I only, I'm pragmatic. And this is about this case. But the thing he's actually serving for, and this is why I sent these anonymous emails to him, because I was afraid he was going to be let on the street before my book was out and he would be suicided. And then the media machine would easily make the world believe that he did it, for sure. And I'm talking now the McCanns, the Clarence Mitchell, and the whole machinery. They would make him look guilty. And people would be satisfied. Everybody would be satisfied. The problem was that I had a brick coming, right? The book. And that was a big problem for me because I knew it would be very hard for me to get that out. So that's why I sent the email to the German prosecution that keep him safe because he, he's, he's at risk. I'm surprised nobody's taking him out actually, even from within jail, because that would be useful. And this is the thing about Operation Grange, you know, they were looking for a patsy and the perfect would be a pedophile and preferably dead, right? And, um, and the reason I'm so hard on that on Operation Grange was because uh, uh, Colin Sutton, who was the one in scope to lead it in the beginning in 2011, 2010, he got a call from some of the top brass at Met and say, you know that you're not going to be able to do your normal work, you know, that means excluding the, peop the people closest to the child, right? And you will not be able to look at any wrongdoing by the parents, end of story. So he didn't want to take it because he's an honorable man, right? And um, so basically that's a definition of a cover-up. That's why I, I don't worry about uh, saying that out in the open because it's basically proven by their actions. And this is why it keeps spinning. They keep the funding. Because as soon as the funding stops, the Freedom of Information Act, is that what it's called, um, are going to start flowing, you know, to see what they did. And I know they're probably, I mean, their team, golf handicap has probably been mostly reduced, and that's a really good result. But beyond that, they, they have nothing to show for. Who were the main suspects in 2007? Who, who, how many suspects has there actually been in the Madeleine McCann disappearance? Yeah, here's the thing, that after the McCanns um, were uh, uh, in the scope of, of the investigation, um, they turned on Robert Murat, who had, he's a British Portuguese bilingual, and he was living right in the neighborhood. And so he was a, a translator, and they turned on him and tried to frame him, actually. Uh, Jane Tanner said that it, it it was him. They put him in, in a car with the, the glass window thing and she pointed him out. And uh, yeah, and there have been some shady people, but uh, I don't think Robert Murat was uh, an Arguido officially uh, based on that. I think, I just think he was investigated. But uh, like you said, there's been, they've been looking for it. There was some, a Polish couple that had been on some videos. Uh, uh, they were excluded uh, pretty quickly. Um, yeah, so that's that's a good question. It basically was, they, they turned on Murat, he was out, and then they found the guy, the perfect suspect, Christian Bruckner. But he was, he, he has an alibi, I would say, and uh, obviously they have zero evidence against him. That's zero, because Helge Bushing, the, the type of person he is, and his credentials, and the, uh, uh, asking for payments for these statements, and they caught him in a lie, I think now. So actually, I think Friedrich Fulcher, Friedrich Fulcher uh, are actually going up against him, actually, uh, for him. Yeah, there's... What's the main standout for you in this case in Madeleine McCann's kind of disappearance? What's the one thing that stands out to you that's 100% proven that just makes everything fall into peace? Oh... Uh, Number one, Jane wasn't there to see anybody. Matt wasn't inside the apartment to check. That's enough. Is that There's no abduction. Is that proven? I uh, make a really good case for that, yes. Mm -hmm. Forensically, I mean, it could hold in court that he wasn't uh, inside apartment 5A. So why are they not charged with lying? This is the thing. The, the PJ, they have let me basically broken the law for seven years. You know, illegal surveillance... Uh, uh, digging in national parks, uh, harassing people. They know about my emails. I updated them. I had a one contact person that I trusted because I knew that as soon as there was some information from the PJ to Operation Grange, 
then I wouldn't get any juice on the camera in the in the in the bush on the hillside. So um, that was a big problem for me. I actually wanted to solve this very easily in the beginning. I tried to get in contact with Amaral, and I knew that if he could get me two, three people that we could trust, and we get the intelligence when Kate lands in the Algarve, then we would be waiting there for her to show us where it is, where she visits. Because this is my theory, you know, that she come back all these times. It's emotional. And... Imagine your worst nightmare, your mother, your firstborn child, IVF treatment, hallelujah, you get your biggest dream and you lose her. And the biggest nightmare, she's taken, and then you go back to your worst nightmare like eight times a year. That doesn't make sense, right? Unless it's to control something and to, and now we're getting into something that uh, I'm surprised about uh, the tabloid media. And in, in, this is also about why nobody speaks about this book. There seems to be some kind of injunction or something about this because other books about the Madeleine McCann case have been touched and, uh, you know, counter rid ridiculed. I'm just waiting for ridicule, you know, because I'm very confident about the timeline. I'm very confident. Um, and mathematically about these things that I discovered on the hill and what's on the video and the, the, the context of me emailing, playing this game, it's almost mathematically impossible that this is not connected to everything and that she's there. So um, um, let's talk about that yeah. then. So when you started looking into the case, you got involved with it, you set up cameras and because did they not go back every year? This is the first year they've never went back in 17 years. Is that correct? Who are they? Madeline and Jerry. Uh, Kate and Jerry. No, Kate's been every year. She said even in the interviews that she's down to twice per year now. But I can tell you, since I started this, she hasn't been that many times back there. The first 10 years, they were, uh, you know, several times per year. And what made you pick this spot? Why do you think Madeline is buried here? This was the thing about, like I said, I was convinced about the hill, number one. Number two, I did a methodical search about where I would have done it and where it's possible to dig that deep because it's very hard terrain. And then I had these uh, three main areas. I uh, went through the first area and then the third area was too close to, to people, to a resort. And then I, when I started to, to look at the, the second area, I noticed there was a pink flower there that didn't belong there. It was plucked somewhere else and didn't belong on the hillside. And it was put on this stone. It was very weird, but it was very close to a main track. And I have a very creative mind and I thought, could, it, could this be? that she's here. This was right before the 10th anniversary. This is when I started this. I started 18th of March. This pink flower was April 5th. And that was right when I started to, to, to scan the, the area two where I found everything. And this pink flower was on the bottom between two, area two and three. And I went downtown, I got a drink, and then I'm sitting below the church with the palms. And then I see this pink flower. That's where they are. They're on the foot of that palm. And then I could imagine that she's been by the church and she goes to her rock on the beach. This is her words. And maybe she plucked that one and went up there and left it there. And I probably missed her if that was her by two, three hours on that Sunday. So that started thing. And then I had this thing I told you about. I looked for a grave in the area, symbols, romanticizing a grave out of guilt, Kate going back. And then I looked for the letter M, pink flowers and a heart symbols. And I found all of these things, not right away, because these were so subtle. I mean, it wasn't like I was so in love with my theory that I looked in, you know, you look at the clouds, you see Mickey Mouse and, and, and Pluto there, uh, you know, every day, if you, if, you, if you really want to. If you look for it. Yeah, yeah, exactly. But this was more like, uh, I couldn't even see it. So I took a camera, lifted it up from the ground. And then when I came home and zoomed in and looked at it, said, hey, wait, what is this? Or it was hidden partially because of the clubs were up at that time. So it wasn't something I discovered like that, even when I was looking for it. So these were extremely subtle things. And some of the symbols were a little distorted by someone kicking one of the rocks. But I found these hand-placed uh, rocks because that was the fourth thing I looked at, things that were hand-ornamented or some place in nature made special for like a memorial or something. And then this spot one was uh, right at the bottom of, of uh, the lower part of uh, area two. And uh, and I decided one, because I went to the police again, try to get in contact with Amara, and then they say, well, it would be easier for us if you check for yourself, because I didn't want to be the guy that digs for a body in the night, and I did. And I started one area, and then something, I just got this thing, hey, th this is not this is not the place. And I stopped. So I had like a, a little bump in the ground right next to one of these symbols. It was actually another symbol on top of that one. 
So I changed my mind inside this uh, cave-like uh, structure under the tree. But anyway, so this is what the, I put up a camera there instead. How many miles away from the hotel? Oh, this is uh, one kilometer exactly. Not that far? No. Surely if you're getting rid of a body, they're not that, like I say, they're intelligent people. You go further, no? Well, here's the thing, the genius about that. This is also about the paranoia. Like you said, if you have a car, you think about the tracking. But keep in mind, if they are being seen somewhere else, right, in the region, in the future, if you show up somewhere, people will always think, what are they doing there, right? Anywhere else, if they see her, them there, but not on the hill, because they made sure on that photo shoot, look, we run here, nothing to see here. Even mentioning how many minutes they spend to run to the hill top, everything, right? And that was a lie, because I did it seven minutes faster, and I was, they'll beat me by two minutes, for sure. They'll do it in 10, that stretch. So um, it was a brilliant place, even though maybe they didn't have much choice, but it was a genius place because in the future, they could always visit her grave with nobody having any suspicion, even if they saw them there, not sitting by the grave. So it has to be hidden. And my spot five is like, almost like you, if you wrote a novel and, and found it for this purpose, it would be perfect. So what happens when you're digging then? Uh, Did you, were you given the green light by the police to uh, do this? Yes. Yes. Why? Because of media and because of the political pressure. This is why, oh yeah, that's why I lost my track earlier. The PJ, why aren't they communicating with me? Because they know I will check it myself if they just don't contact me. But it's political. Because I, the chief of uh, Policia Judiciaria, PJ, the, the criminal police, he has a book. He got it in hand, uh, well, not in hand, but the, it was an agreement to deliver the book to him at the office. Uh, his assistant received it from uh, the publisher. So why the silence? Because it's a headache. They want it to go away. Even Amaral, before he moved, he got a phone call. It doesn't matter if this one gets shelved, right? But he knew the truth and he was, um, he didn't want to give up. He, I don't know if he lost his pension to write the book, but it was like a, a fair deal. He probably came out even and he could have made another million if he pushed it to the, over, you know, here. So you're digging what you so you're looking for the body? Yes, remains. And what did you find? The first uh, spot, uh, I finally got a meeting with the PJ after eight months. It was the Norwegian consul who set this up with a CSI contact they had. And that was interesting for me because I, I, I finally got to present my, my, this was early stage of this. This was spot one area. I had the Jerry on camera and I had these symbols. And um, how long did you set the cameras up for? How long did you have the cameras there? Five years. That's Going in the night. That's a lot of Memory footage. sticks, battery change in the dark. And how many times did you see Kate and Jerry? Uh, I don't want to go into details. I write in the book that I have them. Uh, Why not? Uh, no, it's nice that they don't know everything, you know, because this is, of course, a game of chess. But you know? could they be back just, like I say, to show the love just every year, just the anniversary, maybe a quiet spot, maybe a peaceful spot. Yes, yeah, exactly. Yeah, and that would be their only, but the reason... Or do it, you think there's more to the madness? Well, the, the point is, if that was true, if they knew, for example, if they had hit her elsewhere, okay, why wouldn't they now promote getting that dug up? Because then my book will drown, right? It will drown. And, uh, and my timeline would disappear with the book, right? Which is the jackpot here, is the timeline. K keep in mind, this is an impossible find, let's be honest, right? And you have a small body in a bag um, in the ground, uh, 17 years, what's left, you know, all these things. Even if you're right, you may not find anything, right? A zipper, you're in the slope, you have gravity, you have water, it can be, you know, it could be 100% correct and there's nothing there. So why wouldn't they push this, they could say to Operation Grange, hey, why don't you go and dig up the whole hillside? Why not take the dogs, dogs back out? Because I read that- Oh, I was gonna do it. A corpse, they can move a corpse body. They, they've done a test, a blind test with a corpse, 40 years old, Yep. moved the corpse and the dog still found the corpse. Yep. So there's clearly still sent there for dogs, and this has only been 17 years. The thing is that the context of this this 
cat and mouse game and who showed up and that they got so scared to a point where they actually sent friends that nobody knows who is. I call them the nuggets, the golden nuggets. They know who they are when they read this book. And uh, that's probably a joker, <laughs> you know, in this card game. Uh, it's not a game, you know. I, I, you know, for me, it was about getting her remains back home for a proper burial. That's all. Not selling books because I would be an idiot writing 850 pages and doing this seven years to make money. You know, that's impossible, right? Unless you find it, right? But so that doesn't matter to me at all. Um, but uh, the truth matters to me, uh, and uh, that's the thing. It's the timeline. You know, she died um, the last hour before midnight. Uh, I mean, the last hour of uh, May second. And um, yeah, oh, about moving the body, uh, digging. Um, yeah, I was going. You know, uh, the police. Uh, they had this. Uh, I was. Uh, I was allowed to to present this to these investigators. I had two of them. They were actually on the case when I was there. CSI guys, both. Um, and then all of a sudden there were three, and then there were four, and then there were five, and they were like, you know, they couldn't believe it, right? So they wanted to meet there in the afternoon to show them these two guys um, in civil. And uh, I went to Valencia that Christmas, uh, 2017, uh, for a week. And they took the ground penetrating radar from the geolo geolo geology department in Lisbon um, to check out my spot one, you know. Um, and he said it was only rocks there. But I had a video of uh, Kate and Jerry hasting by to an area higher up. Um, so when I came back from Valencia, I found everything I needed to know there, even though, I mean, the area, there were several things there. And, um, and, um, the interesting thing about, um, uh, people say, oh, what if they moved to the body? Yeah. But then they wouldn't show up there and show fear. They would just ignore it. If somebody's getting close to something that it actually was there or something, they would never show up in, in this context of this game. It's, it's not to be too technical. You have to read it to, uh, to get the whole story, but it's a wild story. Could they always be shown up to make sure maybe they're not going to start a new project, build new houses, maybe dig up the land? Uh, who? Kate and Jerry. Well, you know, it's about when you have, you know, ho your whole life basically depends on something not being found. Uh, it's about control, you know, fear. And in 2014, actually, when uh, the new dogs were coming in, actually to do a new survey, they didn't know where. But they did it on the west side of town. There's a little hillside there, ridiculous, right in front of the condos. So uh, um, instead of the hillside, but they didn't know that. But they had so many flights down there with family and you in 2014. It was like ridiculous. You wouldn't even believe it if I told you. It was on Mail Online. Actually, you can find it very easily. So they were. So it's about control. And if something is about to be discovered, you get fear. And also, why didn't they tell Operation Grange, which would have they would have told PJ and PJ would have told me, you know, that they're being harassed with emails if they were innocent, right? That makes sense. Why would you show up instead? And Mail Online actually said that they'd been there in 2017 in March and May, which matches my work there. But I have them in November, December. Why would they go unofficially, right? So that's interesting. They're on camera when they're not supposed to be there. So all these things is a contextual thing, right? And again, I had the philosophy of it doesn't matter if she's there or not because of the timeline is so important. And when you see how I, they reveal it through evidence, you know. So what does that mean then? If they are saying, yes. what does it mean? Well, if the police don't do their jobs, you know. Even the, if they go back, what does that mean? Uh, I mean, you know, uh, to the... Kate and Jerry, yeah, if they're going back to Portugal, maybe pay their respects. Like, what does it mean if they're saying, yeah, we went there, may... Yeah, Kate was and, there and with her. Bar, but they yeah. were there another two months. What would yeah, that Kate was mean? there with her daughter uh, observed in Lush, uh last year. and um, With one of the twins. Yep. Yeah. And um, they never have any more kids. No. So Kate was there with one of the daughters. Yep. Yeah, with uh, the, the only one alive of the two they had. Matt is dead. So, yeah. So she was there. And the interesting thing is that uh, one of these spots there's been some gardening service done there, which is very, that was surprise. I didn't, uh, surprising to me. I, I didn't have a camera there. This is really, this is uh, spot five. People are speculating if I'm playing with people's minds there. Uh, you know, of course I have surveillance there, but I, there was some areas there are problematic. Two weak trees swaying in the wind, thousand video 
triggered in a in a windy night. You know, it's a problem with batteries and memory cards, all these technical stuff, surveillance. But um, I saw that something had been done in this area, and it matches also her visit there. I don't think she brought her daughter there, but um, if she took, a, I'm very surprised she actually went to the real spot because mostly they sent their friends to spots nearby. Of course, that's their life insurance. You know, anybody can turn on you, right? And put pressure and uh, risk something. So you never show them the real spot. You show them something nearby, right? And it got closer and closer and closer. I'm not saying I'm 100% correct, but I just want it to be checked. It will be checked. The PJ is waiting for me to do it on my own. I have a team in South Africa of eight persons with dogs. I had a dog, you, you were asking, sorry. Uh, I had a plan during COVID. Um, there was a black German shepherd in Southern Sweden in the university there, uh, archeology span dog. He was gonna come, um, but um, COVID stopped that and uh, he died eventually. So there were plans, but then again, I thought it's, it will be checked anyways, right? But um, yeah, or you just go and dig, right? And I have two super spots, two, three. It very, we're talking very close area, 30 by 40 meters. And then this uh, focal area in uh, 15 by 15 meters. Could you not use some other technology to, s to detect? To see if yeah, you, you think about a zipper in a bag, you know, metal detector, of course. Um, It'll just be bones now. But yeah, well, no, I think the, the zipper is still uh, alive and kicking. Um, um, uh, but um, it can slide in the ground. The only thing is that you, it gets very compact there because of the clay content in the in the ground. So every, everything gets compacted like concrete. Yes, yeah, so it's not so you. So, it's not so, like a grave. No, but you have a slope, so you don't know what's happening underneath the top surface uh, motion, but probably not so much. It gets very hard. And this is on top of a mountain? Well, this is on a hillside, on a, on a slope. So, um, and so, um, yeah, so that, but again, it was about, there comes a time where you need to release that information, a book about the, um, the timeline, mainly for me, and then the rest will solve itself. If people said, oh, what if somebody removes? Yeah, well, maybe they'll get caught doing it, you know? And I'm not waiting for that to happen. I'd rather have professional survey it like a crime scene, like it should. And also because you have something very small, shrinking, you know, remains in a bag um, under severe pressure because it's probably deeper than one meter deep. I'm guessing 120-ish with rocks on top. Um, that uh, you want it to be aired with these uh, stakes to make it air. And then you have cadaver dogs or archaeology dogs and um, and do a digging. Eventually it will be dug up. I see the social media now. People said, hey, let's go dig it up. Right. I I, I don't, uh, you know. What would you do if you dug it up and you found a body? Well, you find the remains, you call the PJ, and then everything would be How okay. Who would you react? Yeah, yeah. Who I would react? Well, you can imagine. Talk about adrenaline. Is it a sense of relief? Or yes. A sad? Still a, a baby? Still Both. An innocent young girl? Both. Because it's like, whew, finally, you can remove the clouds over Pride Deluge. The truth is out. You know, people are also speculating, oh, but how does that connect to them? Well, read my book and you'll see that it's impossible. That could be a coincidence. That it was an abductor who did that, you know. What, cause was obviously because that bag could be not be identified, but I suspect it could be the missing bag they're talking about that was photographed the next day in the, in the cabinet. But um, I believe that she was um, removed by um, these big black garbage bags in a triple four layers to the cemetery. And then when they got the car, and then there was a switch um, um, I mean, they used for personal reasons, like a burial casket used, not just some you know, random bag by somebody, but it personalized it by Jerry's tennis bag, for example. It's very interesting how Dave, David Payne explains this bag and he uses the word hide about a tennis racket. You don't use the word, you put a tennis racket in the bag, right? And he's saying it's not it was big enough to hide a tennis racket in. So it's kind of, this is interesting statement analysis wise, that how much they're leaking. So this is my interpretation of, of the facts that are presented by them. And uh, yeah. So them, you yeah. believe Madeline died in that apartment. They've put Madeline in a tennis bag. 
later. Check the tennis bag was photographed the day after. So it was there, but it was later missing. So you can talk about when they hired the car and it was 25 days later. Yeah, the that's corpse. when that bag, that probably was, or possibly was used but that's, as her final. But that's dangerous from an intelligent couple who then still be getting surveillance, media all around the world to be then going, picking up a dead daughter, their dead body, and then taking it somewhere else. But that is very dangerous. When you see the cemetery location, where you can park the car, how you can do that easily. Uh, and um, but to do it in the first three weeks is... Yeah, well, four it's, weeks, yeah. It's scary. Yeah, yeah, this was a month after, yeah. Uh, full moon too, which is convenient up there on the hill. You Why? don't need uh, lighting there. You have uh, like reflective lighting, uh, what do you call it? Uh, uh, yeah, spread lighting from the town up to the hill, mm -hmm. but on full moon, it's perfect up there. Almost have to wear shades. How connected is Jerry? Because you talk about Gordon Brown, oh. who's a former prime minister. Has he got connections where he can so powerful that he can cover something like this up? Or is that a bit far-fetched? Uh, it's not far-fetched. You know, the boys club also have an, an oath about helping their brothers. But um, I don't know. I don't care. I just know there, there was one bouquet of flowers at one of the first memorials they had at home. There was one, you know, Masonic Lodge uh, flower bouquet. And I heard that he's a Mason and that he, he was a friend of Gordon Brown's brother and they were Masons. And uh, uh, I don't care too much about all these things. I'm, I only look at the facts and the words of what they're actually telling and try to keep it simple, the simple lines. And you say, and, and why the cover-up? And imagine, you know, you protect the, the pride of your nation and your flag and the crown, and you have four doctor families using neglect as their alibi, or were neglecting them, all of them locking the children in the apartment to go and dine across the pool. Uh, is that enough? Uh, and then you can say, oh, sedation, you know, sedating their kids. I'm a son of a doctor. I know the, how they view <laughs> you know, pharma. Uh, my father was a psychiatrist or a drug dealer, whatever. Same thing, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> yeah. And um, so, but it's, keep in mind also the fear in these friends when you have one accident happen in one apartment. They're the unlucky ones, but you have a very resourceful guy who knows he cannot call an ambulance. What's the problem with calling an ambulance if your daughter has cracked her head and is dying behind the sofa? It's because when she's taking in, they always check below the belt on the uh, drama of children in the, in the circumference of their nearest family. They always look, is there a reason for this? And this has to do with sexual abuse, of course. Um, when children grow bigger and they start to talk, they go to kindergarten and the parents uh, are afraid what they're going to start to talk about, they become a liability. And sadly, we're living in a world that uh, there's a lot of young children disappearing, right? And I think that has something to do with it, that the, there's been abuse and uh, they become a liability. And, um, but you can't call the ambulance. What do you do? You already know that they have, you have to hide the body. What time did they actually put all the kids to bed? Yeah, around 8-ish. Uh, Which is earlier, especially on holiday with the sun. You've got the swimming pool. Sim Everybody kind of... Exactly. They're tired. But here's the thing. They put them in the crash and they have activities and, and like home, you know. And it wasn't particularly warm. So you had that warm time. Oh, get me ice cream and I'm tired of the beach. And the no, they were just in the group playing with the kids. Of course, they get tired. And But she never cried with the nanny. Imagine that the whole week. So she was happy until... Yeah, and there's other speculation about trafficking and stuff, but I, I stay away about this, you know. Why? This, I keep the simple stuff, you know. I just want to focus on what's Could it possibly be, though, that everything is possible. she was drugged, she was abducted, yes. and she was no, trafficked? That, no, there was no abduction because that's physically impossible. The, the window of opportunity wasn't there. And also the statements about the patio door was locked. He said they opened them on the Wednesday, and she said they were unlocked the whole week, Kate. But Jerry said that he opened it on the Wednesday. And then when you see how it correlates to all the other things pointing to May 2nd as the accident, then, um, you know, it becomes kind of evident and simple and clear. And everything makes sense based on that. And it wasn't, I didn't want this to fit my grandiose theory. Not at all. If I found one thing that created doubt in me, 
I wouldn't write that book, right? Not because I'm afraid of risking anything at all, anything for the truth. But if you have honestly doubt about possibly being wrong, you know, I would hesitate until I discover more, right? So you keep going until you have enough, but there was nothing and everything pointed to that. That's why I'm so hard on the, the night before. The book should have been called, you know, the night before. But the reason I called it the sudden impulse is actually because the um, Jerry's own words, you know, they had the story about they've been watching us for days, right? That was the public image. But then Jerry has his plea to the abductor on his blog about, oh, it could have been an, you know, a sudden impulse, a madness, an accident. So he mentions accident and a sudden impulse. So this is a, it's called an embedded confession. It's basically his plea to us that he, whoosh, and this is about with the, the top of nine. So they have this leader, he takes charge and they help. They're on the lookout, the back patio. They put her into the bedroom first. I don't think they cleaned the blood. This is about the cadaverine scent because the theory is, I mean, for amateurs, the theory is, that, oh, it takes 90 minutes to develop cadaverine scent in the body, right? So it has to be at some certain spot for over 90 minutes. I think pretty quickly it was moved out of the living room into the cabinet area by their bedroom where the cadaver dog uh, marked. Um, and... Uh, the blood was there, but keep, keep in mind it's dark and he's a doctor and you've seen enough of CSI or whatever programs on TV, you know, with the UV light, you have to clean it properly when you're going to clean and you may not even have the equipment. So I think the blood was left there for a while till daylight, till they had the equipment to clean it. And the cadaverine was developed in the blood itself because there's an enzyme and an amino acid that is present in a pretty high level in young children that actually, so you get cadaverine from the blood itself. And I think that may have been a surprise to them. And this is what Peter McLeod discovered uh, for me. I just, you know, like I'm a simple guy. So I keep to the main things. And, and this, uh, this Peter McLeod from Nottingham Police, uh, by the way, he has scrutinized my book. He was on an earlier timeline in terms of the last photo being on the Sunday. He was earlier on the group that believes that she died in the apartment on the, the 29th or 30th, like the second and or the third day there on the holiday. But he actually, he um, has tried to find flaws in my book and he read it three times and he now believe me and, and that's a huge step for me. That's, you know, a success for me, but the main success is of course, the truth is out. I'm not out to destroy these people, you know. Like I said, if I was the Tapas friends, I would do the same thing for them. Right, I would help them hide the body if it, there was no, you know, it's the SA thing. It changes everything. Bad luck and saving the family of the twins. Yes, I'd do anything for that. You know, it's mm -hmm. a good thing. Instead of destroying four families, you know, let's say SA was not involved in any of these families. You know, of course, you do anything got, yeah. to save them. You've got to question why the families have never been doing podcasts or more interviews. Yeah, 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 she exactly. Would do you it consistently it. Yeah. of trying to get more information out yeah. there. There's just been nothing. Yeah, that's suspicious. And uh, yeah, I started earlier about the, the tabloid here. They should know that, you know, the, um, it's not a big secret that Kate and Jerry, they are not a couple and they haven't been for years. You know, she was never a McCann. That's the first thing. And she in the hearing, in the Levison inquiry, was a, um, hey, my name is Kate McCann. No, it's not. Her name is Kate Healy. She was never a McCann. She was married to Jerry McCann, but that was never her name. In the crush record, she uses that. That's to make it simple, I think, you know, that you have the same last name uh, of the parents to make it easier for the, who does this child belong to, right? Does it's, she have the same name, though? Did they change her name at the wedding? Uh, no, she she's Kate Healy in she her passport. Changed, she never no. changed her name? No. But here's Why? the, yeah, I don't know. Uh, ask her. <laughs> so, so. Uh, but the thing was, um, uh, they haven't been a couple, even there's a pro McCann people, in Luge, confirming that they're separated. I don't know if this is legal, but I'm surprised the tabloids here, but they're not allowed to touch it. And that's uh, why I mentioned about this injunction, about not talking about things that are evidence or going against the narrative of an abduction. Because, uh, you know, there is zero evidence of an abduction. Zero. Nothing. Nada. Zilch. And still, you have Operation Grange spending 14 million pounds looking for an abductor in a missing person case where there are zero signs of an abduction, that's insane, right? No, it's not. It's called a cover-up. 
What about Madeline McCann? Because there was also rumours that it wasn't Jerry's daughter. This is very interesting. So I don't know how they do it in the DNA test because they, you know, you protect the integrity of, of a person if they use the donors, you know, all these things. There's probably a system for that. I haven't researched. I don't care. But there was one thing uh, very strange. But, you know, anybody can glitch. It was Jerry in a Spanish interview and Kate sitting next to him. And he's pointing to her and he's calling Madeline her child. And he corrects himself, uh, our child. That's the first glitch on that. That could point to that possibly being a case and then the twins actually being his. But uh, psychologically, you could say, oh, yeah, the distancing. And this is my profiling of Kate about her giving her a grave. Because if it was up to Jerry, she would be fish food. I, I hate to use those words, but let's be, you know, we're talking reality here. Pragmatic survival mode, Jerry mode. And uh, that would be in the ocean, of course, you know. Um, but uh, for Kate, being not a devout Catholic, but a Catholic, according to her mother, she's not devout, um, she would not occult the body. And But imagine that she wasn't aware, but she was semi-aware or blind eye to what was going on. She must have, I, th I think that when she got the twins, it was very hard for her to handle the three of them. She couldn't work full time, for example. And there was a rumor in one of these questions uh, you mentioned of the 48 about family taking custody over Madeline. Remember, you mentioned that one of the questions the police wanted to ask her, is this true? Uh, so the distancing uh, to Madeline when she got the twins, and uh, imagine Madeline being uh, essay abused um, and then becoming more outspoken, difficult, loud, all these negative things, right? Uh, um, she feels guilt and then you have the accident and then the guilt Kate must feel then because of the distancing to her first child and making her a victim of whatever uh, might have happened. Uh, and this is how I, I felt that it was a guilt-driven thing for her. At least she could do for her was to give her a grave and the romanticizing and then the symbolism and then, but them being not together and Kate being, well, he, had, he was busy working, right? And she had the twins, but she was back so many times. And this also makes sense in terms of um, them not being a couple, actually. And this is a source that I have a very trusted source who overheard a conversation with her boss, um, with one of their neighbors. Um, and uh, that Jerry was dating a young model and uh, they haven't been a couple for many, many years. And this was confirmed about this pro McCann on the, on the cliffs saying that they've been separated for years. But imagine the story of this. This is the biggest media case in history and also the biggest missing person case. But imagine, you know, them splitting up because that's what normally happens when a young child disappears in a family. There's always some guilt you know, uh, subconsciously something, they don't agree, you know, you're sedating, oh, you didn't check when you were supposed to, whatever the story is, there's always something that will tear them apart because the joy is gone. And the memory of when they're together with the other, there's always one missing, you know, it kind of destroys a marriage, uh, makes sense. Yeah. And um, I think that's just normal for couples who do lose yes. children. The, 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 the percentage of breakup is very high. Yes. Not just Kate and Jerry. Yeah. It's, um, yes. Everyone, because yes. I've interviewed uh, Ashley Kane, and I know he split up with his missus. They love each other, but they just couldn't take the yeah. pain of losing. Yeah. It was just too much. Yeah. And uh, But like I say, it's what about, I know people can go down the conspiracy route you talk about and being a mason. People saying it could be possibly a sacrifice. No, that's for me. I, I far fetched. No, here's the thing, actually, because I I saw some of them actually, and this is the thing about how I discovered that they hit her on in the cemetery. The cemetery is uh, about half a mile from the church, and in Portugal they have this. Uh, uh, it looks like a casket, stone caskets, like a mausoleum uh, above ground. You can just slid the top sideways and put it inside. She could still be there if it wasn't for the finding in the rental car. By the way. So um, I did a check on that actually with the uh, CB's lawyer, Christian Berkner's lawyer. We did a test uh, very honorably and respectfully to check it out if it was possible. And it was, and it was perfect. So there was a statement by Kate that she for weeks and days, days and weeks, that she had a vivid slideshow of uh, seeing Maddie on a large gray stone slab mottled 
And this is the thing also people were seeing then the sacrificial satanic ritual table thing. Um, so I kind of get that, but uh, I, I, I like to use Occam's razor, simplicity. You know, the simplest uh, line of thought is most often the, the, the logical and the truth and reality. So I, I like to stay on that path as hard as I can and as long as I can, uh, unless you have to divert. Um, so this, this uh, her vivid dream, uh, this was at the same time they were talking about, you know, pedophiles been taking her and she's alive. But then she had for days and months, it wasn't like a reoccurring nightmare, for days and months, uh, sorry, days and weeks, not months. And this is how I discovered the time they moved her exactly on the month because of what she wrote in the diary. Everything fits together. The way she wrote about June 2 in her diary confirms this. But uh, let's get back to the, the, the large gray stone slab, which are those. And you have one at the bottom and one at the top. I was confused about that because I thought she was laying on, but she can be on the bottom one, right? And under the top one. That's why it confused me a little bit. But you talked about the, the abuse. I think that's where the ritual thing came from. People saw that statement. Mm -hmm. um, and um, Because and, people's minds can go wild, and rightly yeah, so, yeah, yeah, because yeah. it is yeah, yeah. But they fall in the, so intriguing. But they fall in love with that. And this is uh, also one of the very sensitive parts, you know, because there's a big community in the truth. They know there was no abduction. There's no doubt. And it's actually physically impossible, chronologically impossible, because you have one entry and one exit. And then they dramatize it that that the abductor was there during jerry's check they use it like a drama instead of letting police dis figure out what is the the window of opportunity what happened and what is the highest chance of finding her you know so their narrative is like carved in granite with the jane tanner man um and things like that um yeah about the cemetery there was a, a mat He's describing to the police where he searched on the west side of town. And then he points at the street and he said, uh, the name is Cemetery Road. And that seems like a horrible, and then he catches himself before saying the last word, the next word. And the next word is coincidence, right? And he stops himself from saying coincidence, Cemetery Road, because it aligns with death or that she actually was there. Right, so these are these things that kind of how I work with statement analysis. What about the photo with the red shoes? The people are saying it's like a cult. Is that Jeremy Can that's in that yeah. photo with the red shoes? Yeah, They've well, all get the red shoes on. Well, for me, I looked at that photo, and for me, immediately, I I, I can tell that is not Jerry in that photo. Just, but it, you know, it's again, it's getting into a territory that is irrelevant to the case, actually. And then you have, of course, the. Podesta brothers uh, thing and they, they talk about uh, the Freud the grandson of Sigmund Freud but he didn't own that villa then I actually thought that he might you know the 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 freezer that Amaral talked about that it was uh, if it was in the garage of Freud for example which was one of my wild ideas in the beginning but he didn't own the apartment and then you wouldn't need to move the body in the rental car because you could just walk up the hill because his villa is right right below the first plateau so you could just, uh, that would not uh, uh, happen. Um, uh, where were we? Um, yeah, we're talking about the red shoes. Yeah, you know. For but the, the Podesta brothers are always mentioned Yeah, okay, as well. so yeah, this is. They are always yeah, now mentioned. We're, now we're getting into the, this is the thing, they call the Smith siding. So here's the thing. So there's an Irish family. They were walking from uh, the Dolphin restaurant up the street, a very dark street coming down uh, around 10 p.m. They see a man carrying a child, okay? And uh, and Amaral was also very interested in this sighting. There's a man carrying a child, and then the story is, oh, it's Jerry carrying her down to the sea. It's like, what? You're going down to the bars and restaurants carrying a dead child? This is on the Thursday. But here's the reason that they, they are so, it's become almost like, a, I wouldn't say a psychosis because I don't want to offend them with this theory, but it, they, I, I have to tell some of these people, please go back and look at his first statement of Mr. Smith. So follow this. His first statement, he said, he could not tell which clothes that person was wearing. He could not tell if that person had a mustache. He could not tell if that person had a beard. He could not tell if that person had uh, glasses, were wearing glasses. He could not recognize that person today. And he could not recognize that person on a photo. What do you have? <whistles> Nothing, okay? But then he changes that he actually adds five years on a later statement. But the, the problem is the reason he changed his statement 
that he was certain it was Jerry all of a sudden. Wow, from that start? Because he saw Jerry leaving the, the airplane when they arrived back home um, in September, uh, yeah. Uh, and he carries his son down the stairs, right? And that's really weird because that's exactly how every man in the world will carry their child down the stairs of an airplane. So it doesn't make sense. So he's convinced himself, this is the psychology of people wanting to be in the center of uh, some historical event or something important. It doesn't mean that he's a bad person. You know, it's psychology, it's our mind messing with us. But from his first statement, where he adds from 35 years to 40 years to match Jerry, and then he also changes that he matches his wife or daughter saying that he had these beige pants, you know, from his first statement, he couldn't tell anything, right? So, but the point is, it doesn't serve a purpose of Jerry being there. And basically, he was up there pretending to search because the alarm went half an hour earlier, around 9.30-ish. So they were, he was pretending there. So 10 o'clock, technically, he could run down there and run back, whatever. But the point is, Jerry's too intelligent to walk down with the dead daughter right to the restaurants and bars to go to the beach for what? Hoping the tide would take her away? No. She was already, of course, a day before in the cemetery. But it's, it's, some people are offended with the Smith signing because it became so central. And this is also a, a typical uh, called tunnel vision. It's like, a, wow, if we just had, you know, and there was some talk about, actually, I had an apartment in the building and it was actually the camera into my parking garage. But again, in Portugal, you're not allowed to do the, to a street view on that camera. So it was, I don't know if it was Amaral's own, wor own words or somebody else said that, basically, oh, wow, the magic evidence could have been there of seeing Jerry carrying her down there. No, it wasn't him. And the worst part is actually one of the other, I can't remember if it was uh, Mr. Smith's wife or uh, the daughter, Iofi, or, yeah. They said, they described this man with light brown hair. And this is a very dark spot. And you would never describe Jerry's hair as light brown, not even in sunshine. So it, it, it's, it's, I don't know how it got stuck, but this is the thing about people you always want. And they have played so much. They, they, there's people spinning on this, some really good guys, good, good researchers, that there's some safe house. They were given keys by Murat because Robert Murat, because Jerry wouldn't deny that he knew Robert Murat. Why would they throw him under the bus if he had knowledge that could incriminate them? That's also a little insane, right? You would never... Put him on the spot. He would just tell him, hey, I gave him the key to an apartment. Game over. So that's in that's insane in a way. But it's not because these people are crazy. It's just that you 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 get so uh, I don't know. It's it's like a psychosis. I don't know. I, I've gotten criticism for this because I, I'm very tabloid in my speaking sometimes. I say it's irrelevant, but why is it irrelevant? The Smith sighting? Because she was already dead. I did a masked uh, interview before I came out. And I said, it's irrelevant, you know, because she was already gone. I was speaking a little bit in codes. I don't know if you saw that. I, and and yeah. Portugal, was there many kids going missing no. that year, the last uh, five years or 10 years back then? No, nah, there was once or twice it happened. There was one they discovered, there was in a few years, two years earlier. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Like Jerry said, it's like one in a hundred million or whatever. It doesn't happen, you know, uh, and... Uh, and, and keep in mind, keep in mind, if you were if you were with four friends, you have the corner apartment next to the street. You got two streets there. That's the one you keep open. I mean, unlocked. No, come on, with your wallet and camera inside. No, come on. Of course, everybody did the same. And this is you also have to think: How would you convince your friends to take part in the lie? Number one, you got to get to a point of no return, under influence, a little wine, right? And um, and. Uh, the body was already hidden, so they're in, a, in they're in a soup together, and they all locked them in. And maybe even Jerry, I would do it if I were Jerry. I would say to him, "We're all in the same boat. We lock the children in. You will have child uh, protection agency looks at look at your. You will be scrutinized how you treat your children. And then if you lose your children, it could risk your maybe you get a suspended medical license. I don't know. I know it's very strict, uh, and they kind of correlate. I mean, your your mm -hmm. your could it also be possible though that. Kate and Jerry were in it alone where they, they've then pretended the kid was abducted and then passed the story on to them where they actually believe there's been an abduction or you talking all the kids were drugged all the kids were drugged sexual abuse and every kid they couldn't look at it so we're already in, in it together anyway where 
no matter whose kid died, they would have all lied for yeah. each other anyway. Well, I'm not saying any one of them abused their kids. I'm saying that Dr. Catherine Gaspar told about something that happened between David and Jerry that indicates possible SA. That's all I know from that. We know that they locked their apartments with their kids, the three others, and Kate and Jerry, if you think, look at the first statement, because he said they used the key to the front door, he and Kate. So basically in the first statement, Jerry uh, confirms that all of these apartments were locked. These four apartments were locked with kids inside when they all were down dining. There was, of course, there was one night on the Tuesday, actually, on the Wednesday, Rachel was sick on the apartment next to Maddie when she died, actually. So there was a sickness and one child was sick. Uh, so the, the, the rumor was that there was always one missing from the table. But um, that doesn't change uh, the main thing, yeah. uh, the, the, the plan. So everything, all the knowledge that you have, everything you've investigated, the book you've written, what's your whole rundown on this? What's your whole rundown from the 2nd of May to where we are now? Well, uh, um, like I said, um, there was a, a weak marking, positive marking by the cat of a dog in the, in the bush right outside the patio. So uh, they're doctors. So about getting the body, first of all, getting her out of uh, behind the sofa and they put her in, uh, in the bedroom, probably on some plastic or something to figure out what to do to package her before they get her out and then out in the bush when they've in the timing of finding where to hide her you look at the map of the town cemetery is a good place right perfect uh, you do a little research too but she's in the bush there in multiple layers of plastic garbage bag probably uh, taped together or something whatever you have available um, imagining that would be safe for the cadaver the blood is not cleaned yet put her in the cemetery um, you rent the car three weeks later. They have done a lot of jogging and uh, based on the diary of Kate and her book that she wrote later, you can see her experiences on the hill. Please don't let Maddie be buried here. She begs the praise to God. Uh, three days after her disappearance, she prays that the twins don't fall and bang their heads. That's kind of concrete because that's exactly what happened to Maddie. Things like that. Um, and then you have the rental car. Um, um, the alibi for getting that was, of course, to picking up and family uh, from the airport, which had been coming and going already three weeks. The reason they needed the car was to move the body, I think, um, uh, based on the findings in the car. And it makes sense in terms of the hill uh, because there's two big bumps up the road there. I think maybe there's been some spilling because if you're in the dark, even though it's full moon, you're sliding this uh, granite top you have this plastic bag of a decomposing body, you know, um, don't want to talk sludge and things like that. But there's, uh, Amaral said that the liquid that was found in the car seemed like it had been a cooled or a freezer. And that could align with the, one of these cast granite uh, boxes. Even they're overground, they're con contact with the ground. It was a cold May um, that uh, it was put in the final bag and zipped, but there must be some kind of spill or something so when that bag goes in the back of the boot of the car um there's something connecting to the fiber stair that gives this little the finding of the the cat of our dogs and kila uh, and they found the dna 15 out of 19 markers there as well and uh there you go and um up then it was all about keeping it together getting the the team on board on the the faked abduction the next day pretending everything is uh, you know fine and happy and you can see even in the in the even in their language which is uh, very interesting they always have to remind uh yeah me, uh, fiona she says me and kate and the three kids uh and um uh, and they talk about buying five ice creams on the third you say you buy ice creams for the kids you don't say five no because they're trying to convince us that they were all there madeline too right this is this goes through the whole analysis thing they use these numbers um, Why have they never took a polygraph test? Well, here's the with thing. That's the again reverse psychology. With all the speculation. That's what they you said. You would think, fuck it, I'm going to do yeah, it. Yeah, but they did. They said, oh, yeah, we're going to do a polygraph test. And then there were people were asking for it. And they said, no, it can't be used in court. Well, they knew that up front. That's what you do when you're guilty and you want to appear innocent. You first, you get the PR stunt. Oh, and somebody see. Yeah, I saw on the paper that they are, you know, they're willing to take a polygraph. Yeah, you can't use it in court, but it sure puts a lot of speculation exactly. to bed. Yeah, yeah. 
don't do one test, do two yeah, tests, yeah, and yeah. if you pass two exactly. tests, it's like one in five million to one. So just exactly. end the speculation. But again, they might say, well, why should I? Which is understandable as exactly. well. You're not guilty because you don't do a yeah. test, but with so much speculation hanging over their head, they could have ended it straight away. Yes, of course. But then the question is, why did they say that they were going to take one when they knew that was never going to happen? Of course. So, but that's just, uh, it was a, a media stunt. It Probably 40% of people reading it, you know, never questioned why they didn't take one. But if Madame, if if Madame McCann has failed and bumped her head, then they've not killed her. So why not just call an ambulance? Why not just the doctors as well? Why not just try? Because, you know, when why they... try? Because it seems a bit more far-fetched than to try and cover it up, get rid of the body, and then you are done for murder. So it's a point of no return because the panic of them discovering sexual abuse is everything. Everything. You lose the twins. You can't follow up the mortgage. You get a suspension of your medical license. Both of them. It's over. But... It's not only them involved. You got the the child protection agency agency look into the other families. It would be a nightmare, and it's an embarrassment for you know for Britain, the culture. If that was the culture, you know, in Norway it's different. We we just bring the strollers and they fall asleep eight o'clock at the the table dinner table, and then you stroll back home. If one wants to go to a bar, one goes to the bar. The other one takes the kid home. Yeah, that's what they do. It's like oh, yeah, they everywhere. Go, like, Santa Pons, my yeah. mama, they're just all just to get steaming yeah, yeah, in the yeah, pub. Yeah, yeah. When I mean, you look at it, it is still fucked up. Everybody's drunk and smoking, but yeah. that's the way it was back then. Yeah, but, but they, they wouldn't leave yeah. us in the room in a, in a foreign country. You would just get drunk and you'd go home with yeah. your, your mum and dad when they were steaming. You would go exactly. get some food, go yeah. back to the apartment. Or my mum would take us back. Yeah. My dad would stay and get more drunk. But, but they had, the they had evening crash. This is why... Uh, um, um, they they kind of found uh, Tannerman. They switched him to Dr. Julian Totman. He was one of these guys who played tennis with uh, with uh, Jerry. And actually, Jane had seen him play tennis that same evening with uh, Jerry. Anyways, but she was sorry to interrupt. Him. But yeah. do you think they could be possibly running after day two, day three, to try and find out a new spot for a new burial? Well, I think that as soon as they started running, that's what they were looking for, for sure. Okay. Like two days later, I think maybe yeah. they, I don't know. There's a rumor and not officially, but 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 then it was, the, for me, that was the May 19th, I think Saturday morning, 7 a.m. photo shoot on top of the hill. And uh, I don't know, that's kind of steep, that hill. Jogging there, you're in good shape. But it's like having the church, it's like sh showing, look, we run here, nothing to see here. And what happens after that, they had requests. Can you imagine the best view of the town is from up there? But then the, the response to why wouldn't you take photos that, no, we only take photos where it's a possibility where she could be found. There was this weird answer to that, you know, diverting from photos taking on the hill. Yeah. So, but it was convenient, people knowing they're jogging there. If you see us there, don't worry. You were going to say something there when I interrupted, sorry. Oh, yeah. Dr. Julian Totman, yeah. So this, this, uh, this new DCI uh, Redwood, he came in taking over um, the investigation. I think you were talking about the crash. The, yeah, they have a night the, crash. The so, so, so their, their story was that Dr. Julian Totman popped up from nowhere who had played with Jerry. Oh, I might be Tunnerman, but he was walking the opposite direction and probably not in that time. Otherwise, he would have spoken out earlier. It could be me. So the timeline was off when they supposedly saw Tannerman. Tannerman doesn't exist. This is Jane Tannerman not being there, but according to the plan, she was supposed to be there. But the plan crashed because when Jerry w w were setting off the play, the faked abduction play, he walked out the street without checking the street, which he said he never saw, saw anyone the whole week. And there comes Jez Wilkins from BBC, guy there on a stroller with his daughter uh, or son uh, in a stroller up the street and he crosses the street to chat with him. So he ruins the timeline they had set up for the faked play on this. And so Jane was supposed probably when Jerry was supposed not to talk to him because she was on a time thing and he was going to come to the restaurant, make sure everybody sees him and she goes up and then she sees him and actually goes check. But she didn't. She was waiting for the queue. Right? So she never walked that past them because Jess would have seen her. She walked in flip-flops right by them, this quietest street in the world, narrow street. It's impossible that he didn't see her. So she wasn't there to see him. So uh, DCI Redwood, <coughs> he digs up Dr. Julian Totman, who came from the night crash. So there were night crashes there until 11. So when they go and dine 8 o'clock or something, they could have just pff, 
taking their 8.30 or whatever to the night crash and picking them up 11 and they can do the full dining, no chick, no, no risk, no anything. Or they could just don't be cheap and just pay some of these girls that were taking care of their daughters and say, hey, can't you babysit three hours when we're out drinking? Why doesn't they? they? No, I don't know. It sounds insane because I don't know. I think- Could they just be naive to it all I, as well? And this is, but they're all doctors, but they all can't be like the mechanics. Sally, yeah. Like sedation, you know, drugs. I mean, I know, like I, I told you, I know how my father looked at drugs. He abused drugs, like um, uppers and downers. And, you know, he had a super career. He was like chief medical of Northern Norway before he was mm. 40. But he was using drugs, like these uh, uh, enhancement drugs. And um, and uh, my my uncle in Austria, he worked for Pfizer, like, you know, pushing, selling these things and anything. And the way they look at drugs is unbelievable how... how uh, yeah, and and it could be that way. They were trusting in their what they had, the arsenal. Do you think we'll ever get answers with the Madeleine McCann case? Well, this is the thing. You say, I'm not out to take them or m watch them fall. But of course, that's a consequence of bringing the remains home and giving her peace and a grave at home. And this is what Kate wants too. She leaked so many times that she wanted to end this. And I suspect that she's been under threat. And I'm talking physical threat, not her but the twins have been at risk. And that's why she hasn't left this uh, realm before. Because she, this is with the dream, the turning point dream, this is the media called it the turning point dream. When she called uh, Paiva, the liaison, when Jerry was in the US, she wanted them to actually find it without getting caught. It's a little naive. I mean, if you put this in a novel, you know, nobody would publish it, but that's how it is. If you're not a criminal and you come up with stories, they're bad, even though you're very intelligent. So she had this idea that she could say that she's hidden on rocks on a hillside overlooking in Praia de Luz. That's only one hillside mm -hmm. that that could be, basically. Uh, she wanted them to find it, but that would point to her, right? Or she could pretend she was some, you know, had a vision or something, right? Mm -hmm. And but I suspect that there might be something in that grave that that could point to them. And otherwise, there's a another cuddle toy missing, and there's a pink blanket she might be rolled in, and things like that. It's so sad, Anna. But I, th I don't think she cared about that. She was, this has become too big for her nerves. Do you think someone could possibly break even 17, 20 years later where <sighs> they come clean with it all? I was maybe a little naive uh, that I thought that she could break from my profiling of her in that book. I think they were, they're always proactive. You know, that's their mantra, proactive. It's a defense mechanism. Any criminal would be proactive. You want to know what the police does. You have the manuals on your bedside table. They had literally... Um, and I was thinking that, but here's the thing, as long as they're silent and the media is silent, nobody has to crack and just watch my book go away, but it will creep into Britain, hopefully through you. Thank you, buddy, man, you're one step ahead of anything. But as I was a very shocked and, uh, you know, very uh, honored and sh shocked actually. So I, that's what I meant when I didn't sleep that night. That was the adrenaline. It wasn't something, mm -hmm. you know, anyways. So yeah, cracking. Oh yeah. I, I was naive. I thought maybe... Kate could crack from that to avoid me setting the nuggets up because they're in a very difficult position showing up and their behavior on the videos um, because it implicates them in a conspiracy or in a, you know, um, uh, co uh, corrupt, you know, and uh, yeah, the course so, of justice. Because if you're in the know, you're uh, mm -hmm. already in a criminal position. Give me your short format of it all from the moment uh, Madeline was left in the room. What do you think's happened then until now? This is the third time yeah, he's asking me this. Short version, you know, yeah. a, nobody asked me a short one. Yeah, I know it's very hard. So, uh, no, because we've covered a lot. Of yeah, I know. The sort of rundown of you, what you think actually happened on the night to what happened the prior, previous couple of days to then now. Yeah, well, I, I spoke up to the, the, the hiding of the body. And, um, oh, so you think in the room, Madeline's, they've been, she's been drugged, she's fell off the sofa, bumped her head. She sedated for sure. And uh, um, even though it's not relevant to the falling, it's probably part of the picture because of normally you shouldn't die from that kind of fall. But if she's sedated, she may have lost consciousness before and she has a limp fall, harder fall on the tile and you can have an, you know, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah, and they, they hit the body. And uh, that's that. 
But yeah, that's it. So um, yeah, like I say, I think we've have we touched on everything basically. If we missed anything out, well, the the Smith signing. I, I'm, I'm, you know, there's so many good people involved in these things. And uh, let me mention a few while I remember. Yeah. You have profiler Pat Brown. She's been so generous and sweet. Uh, she started off bashing me with my crazy uh, hidden face uh, masked man um, thing. It was actually created to get attention from potential publishers because I needed to screen them. I didn't want to out myself. It wasn't for uh, publicity or something. But anyways, at least I got her attention. So in, in a way, but, and then she made an apology video. So she's cool. Then you have uh, Isabel McFadden in California. She's a Portuguese uh, American. Uh, she knows everybody in this case. I mean, uh, you talk Operation Grange, uh, PGA, everything. She's been involved from the beginning. Um, she's uh, reading the book now. So she's been very kind, supportive, and generous. And then you have Jill Havern, a very substantial forum with, with the, the king of the forum is Peter McLeod, the former Nottingham Police Superintendent from 1972 to 2000, who is that, I mean, the biggest achievement for me and what I want. I mean, we all have some ego in us, you know, mine has been brushed off through a tough life, but, and it doesn't matter anymore. But uh, when he actually, he was a April 29 guy, a Monday guy that he thought it happened then. Um, and he was with, with the other guys on the, on the 28th, 29th, after the, the last, uh, the photo on the Sunday. They thought that she died after that. That's why there are no photos after that. So it kind of makes sense. And there was no uh, official viewing of her after that Sunday. There was like the cleaner's daughter had seen them walk upstairs for a breakfast. That is the last sighting and that on that Sunday. So it makes sense in a way. But from having him reading my book three times, scrutinizing uh, Sleepless Nights and his reviews is like an incredible credential for me and this book that Peter McLeod, I mean, he's now on, on my team, on the timeline. And Amaral is reading the book. I hope he accepts the timeline and it gives him peace because that was the puzzle. Uh, at first, he was on the May 3, uh, same as Pat Brown, the profiler. Uh, but he now thought about, yeah, they're talking about the, the missing six hours that afternoon um, uh, on the May 3rd. But he is now all more open to it happening earlier. But he wouldn't agree with Peter going all the way to the Monday, the 29th. So I'm on the Wednesday. And th there's so many things that this makes sense is that they didn't have time enough to do it well enough. So they did mistakes. And then you had the crying on the May 1st. So actually you have to be between there. Where do you go forward for the future with it all? If, um, do you I've keep got to... going? Because it's not like a treasure hunt, but it's trying to get answers to put a little girl, yeah. innocent girl to rest. Ooh. But I, because it is, so many people are so intrigued by it. Mm. So it's understandable. But where do you go forward for the future? Do you keep going? Do you get answers? Or does it eventually take its toll when you just case closed? I want people to make up their own opinion. And I think this book could be a game changer in terms of the way this jigsaw puzzle and all the pieces has put so finally together not by design by by what they are you know like with jigsaw puzzle you know you can't force them in place they have to fit perfectly in its place and i think that's what i've achieved with this so the more people that read the book of course now i sound like i'm selling the book and of course yeah, i am yeah, blah blah yeah, blah yeah, so, so. but i you know that's not the point for me it's about the truth and i hate to see all these lies you know we have brenda leyland she was outed she was a tweet uh, you know kind of aggressive but she didn't break any laws she was uh, doorstep by Sky News, and she went and, and committed suicide. Su suicide, uh, Brenda Leyland. Who was that? Uh, Brenda Leyland. She was a middle-aged lady alone, uh, some mental nervous issues, and she was doorstepped by Sky News, and uh, she was outed like a, a McCann troll on, uh, on national TV. She went to a hotel and killed herself, overdosed with helium. I don't know how you do that, but... Helium? Yeah. What the? Yeah, I don't. Blow up a balloon? Yeah, I don't know. It, it doesn't make sense to me. Yeah. But the point Could is, she, she, she died. But this was also this is actually from Jerry McCann himself. He he was talking about a campaign of making an example, and they were creating a dossier. And I think his uh, sister Philomena was helping him with this. And this dossier, she was in the initial files, but she wasn't in the final dossier after the filtration of the police about breaking the law or not she was not she didn't make it to the bad guys but she was still outed and she was the one singled out which is very bad so she killed herself and i i have her I, uh, she's in the memorial in the in the first 
uh, yeah. credit the book. So for people watching, what would you tell them to then? Like you say, you've got to stay open-minded. Jerry and Kate have now been convicted, no matter what anybody says, no matter what evidence is out there. No, this and is they, just a and theory. And they could yeah. have an innocent young daughter being abducted and killed. Well, that's... I can't, yeah, of course, yeah, I understand I it, but yeah. you've still got to stay open-minded that they could be innocent because even though evidence and every, everybody's theories suggest yeah. otherwise, you've still got to be, because what if you're wrong? What if I'm wrong? What if other people are wrong? And can you imagine that what they've been through for 17 years and people have then speculated that they're involved and it was wrong? So I understand people still got to question everything and then make up your own mind. Yeah. Um, but what do you think people take away most from this podcast today? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, you know, it's the first time I've, you know, that open about these things and been sick a week, as you can hear from my voice. <coughs> I can't believe I haven't coughed uh, anymore. Sinus infection and all that stuff, but I'm getting better. And uh, yeah, I don't know. I think uh, hopefully they're curious about what has he put together. Why, uh, well, the difference between me and all the others having written a, a McCann book, because there have been several. Number one is that they have never been ignored like mine. They've been sued and everything. Uh, mine is just completely kept in the dark. Even the mainstream media in Portugal. I rented 500 square meter for the press conference and the main uh, CMTV, CME journal, uh, CM journal in Portugal. The One of the directors said they would be there, confirmed twice, and they didn't show, not a word. So there's something going on and there's something with this book that hits a, a sweet spot. And I am the first and the only one to pinpoint within one hour with argument. I mean, like you can see what I, what I did to, to pinpoint all these angles and there's no angles pointing elsewhere. That is why I did this book. If there was doubt uh, for me, I would just keep going silently investigating this until I probably or possibly or maybe found the remains myself then you can tell the story right but this book is because of the timeline she died the night before that is what i hope people are curious about to find out how did he put this together how can he be so confident about may 2nd between 11 p.m and midnight on may 2nd and why does everything else fit that image the the writing of the handwritten timelines. Why would they lie in between them about when that was written? I proved that. Uh, uh, but it makes sense when you see them for what they are. They're a rehearsal sheet about what to say the next day during then and what to do and which who are going to check. Matt is going to check inside between Jerry and Kate. And um, yeah, and then he changed his mind and then they convinced him after all. So uh, I hope people are curious to figure out what did this amateur military police uh, X do? And why did he do it? Why did he spend seven years of that? Was it to make money? Of course not. Nobody writes a brick like that to make money. I mean, shipment cost, he wouldn't even, you know. Um, but it is, there's something convincing about this guy, I hope, and uh, the curiosity about finding how can he be so certain? What was it that the others missed that he saw? One example is, for example, Martin Grime at the dogs. I have to mention that because you can see it yourself on the Google. You have the whole, the lawyer of the McCann's actually dropped it on YouTube or somebody got it from her and put it on YouTube. You can see Eddie marking very hardly. He, he barks 11 times after uh, picking up and lifting Jerry's uh, light blue O'Neill t-shirt. And coincidentally, you watch, uh, you see Kate making sure she's photographed with it later on the beach, but that's just them being proactive. But it says that one of Kate's tops were positive by Eddie, but he completely ignored them. So Martin Grime, the dog handler, he was intercepted by probably some MI personnel at uh, Faro Airport. This is from Amaral. And um, make, made him switch because her checker pattern, pattern pants and her top was on the list of positives, Kate. But it was actually her pants and a t-shirt that was Maddie or Sean's. And... Uh, and uh, the O'Neill shirt is the strongest positive marking on Jerry's T-shirt in there. And then you can ask yourself, they're showing on the press conference this uh, pajamas. Uh, we didn't talk about that, but that's okay. We can't uh, mention everything. But the funny thing is that if they were had these pajamas that they said were sisters, it should have been under the cadaver testing. And then you would have a shock because I think he would have marked those pajamas that they actually were hers. But that's a different story. 
and then also Cuddlecat. But they tested Cuddlecat in the villa, and they um, and and he marked for the Cuddlecat as well. What about did they not discredit a dog? Did they not discredit? Discredit yeah, one the, of the the, dogs? well, this is the the probably the the worst dog you could discredit because he had a history that was amazing. One know? of the best in the world. Yes, he was. I think he was basically headhunted to the FBI after this, and they made him Martin Grimes set up his own company to be used by other as long as they they lived and How they did work in. But here's the the interesting thing: even Jerry, uh, well, the McCanns, they used an example of a case that these dogs. I mean, Eddie. Did in uh, he marked for Cadaver and I I I'm, I think it was in 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 a car that some guy owned. It was in the back window or in the trunk or something, and then they used that as an example even after it was proven. The guy admitted it that he had transported that dead body in that car after. So they used it as an example even after it was proven it was right. So then why would you do that? That's kind of interesting. Again, before we finish up, where can people buy your book, Bert? Well, it's on the Portuguese uh, website, uh, wook.pt, but you will find it on foreigndetective.com and uh, thesuddenimpulse.com. Yeah, so you can send me the link for this and I'll put it in the comments section. Like I say, people, take what you will out of this podcast today. Um, the information that you've got, search everything and listen, make your own assumption because there is people pro the mechanics and there is people question that there's something not right. Again, we don't have all the answers. All we can do is have a discussion. Like I say, I'm not here to shoot those people down. I have said no, some no, no, things no. and if I'm wrong, I'll be yeah. the first to apologise because it is a little girl out there but yeah, yeah, people yeah. just want the truth and it is a very high profile case where people are always going to speak about it until yeah. there is answers. Bernie, would But you like let me say something. Go go, can I mate? please? Uh, so here's the thing, and this is basically a plea to the public, actually. Imagine being in this shithole and the point of no return coming so fast, your friends doing the right thing, sort of, uh, helping your friends, saving the twins' future and all that stuff, that when the truth comes out, and let's say it happens because of this book or in the near future, either a finding or whatever, people have to be gentle with these people, Uh because imagine the truth in itself is very hurtful for them, you know. So uh, imagine their work, colleagues, family, and uh, have to protect them in some way too. Because it's a very serious business lying about something so small but yet so big, right? Yeah, but again, like you say, I know it's friends, but to hide a, a child, I think that's a different ball game. It's different if you were from the streets, your friends were in a bit of trouble and there was a fight. Possibly you help the brother out, you know what I'm saying? And But a child is different. So for me, it looks as if they've maybe got something on the other people to then all play the game together. And I could be wrong. Maybe they're just all, maybe some people don't even know. There was, maybe the, some have yeah. been manipulated. There was one thing, and that was that uh, I think uh, Matt was investigated for a wrongful death in his occupation and that Jerry was uh, um, one of his main witnesses and supports in that case, someone told me. So, Fever. so um, yeah, so that that could be something on that. And then Dave, of course, was a complicit, if you're talking about SA, from the Gaspar statements. And then you have Russell, best friend with uh, Jerry. So um, what do you have? Um, you have a soup of uh, hiding a, a bad lie. But if you do that, I'll tell you one, that's some staunch friends to then live that lie for so long without anyone breaking. Yeah, well, again, it's not about throwing your friends under the bus. We have the government uh, cover-up. That's the one that has to be protected. Yeah. Like it becomes bigger. It's just, um, it could be a lot bigger. Yeah. It could just be like you said, the other things are just simple where the answers are right in front of your face. But hopefully there is answers. Hopefully the little girl can get laid to rest if she's dead. Some people do think she's alive as well. But how are you feeling today? Very good. Uh, you know, I'm recovering and uh, I'm a little shocked, a little nervous still. And uh, I, I I probably won't watch this again. <laughs> yeah. Listen, yeah, I will. Would you like to finish up on anything else, Bernie? No, actually, I have something that would be interesting yeah. that I would actually, um, I would like to, if you don't mind. Of course, man. If if you don't mind, I'd like to, to read something. Uh, this is, of course, only a theory. I have laid out in the book all the evidence on which I have based it. It is for the readers to decide whether they follow my theory 
or the claim that Madeleine was abducted from her bed, for which, as we know, not a single shred of evidence has ever been presented or discovered by the police force, forces of three nations, nor by numerous fraudulent private detectives and dubious investigative journalists. Let me repeat that. There is not and has never been a shred of evidence of abduction. Here I present 850 pages of evidence of something else. If Kate and Jerry are watching this podcast, what would you say to them? Well, um, that's awkward, right? Yeah. But uh, I'm. people don't like that I have sympathy for Kate, but I have a very good ability in getting into other people's shoes and psychological situation at a time very far back in time. Um, and I think that Kate has been under more pressure than uh, we can imagine. And I think she... Uh, will get the book deal of a lifetime when this is over and they've lost everything. She will stand uh, as a winner if she takes the step and uh, acknowledges the truth. Jerry will do anything to let this go away. He would take away me easily. He could try, though. Bernie, listen, thoroughly enjoyed that. I wish you nothing but the best for the future. I hope you, fully you can find the answers like many people has failed to. But like I say, it's a very interesting topic. Hopefully we can get you back on and we've got some good news. Hopefully... We can lay a little girl to rest and um, puts a lot of the speculation to bed. That's Listen, the big dream. And the big dream as well. You hope she's alive and well. But again, with the information that you've got, it doesn't seem so, which is sad. But like I say, brother, it's a, uh, yeah, it's a messy one, but hopefully the answers come out in the end. So listen, I wish you all the best for the future. Stay safe and good luck. Thank you, sir. Cheers, Thank bro. you.